Welcome to the 25-8 Studios podcast. <laughs> Holy crap, we're back. I know. It felt like a long time since I've actually said that. It has been. Does it feel weird that you haven't said that in a while? No, it's just like riding a bike. <laughs> Is it really? Yes. Why haven't we done a podcast in like four months? Well, I mean, come on, you know. Might even be five. We had, you know, a lot of work, <laughs> political campaigns, uh, you know. And? Traveling. We've both been to Europe. Yeah. Some multiple times. Yeah. You know, working on future projects, which is always amazing. How long were you in Europe for since we've been, since we've been a gone? Well, I, <laughs> since we've been a gone. I was there, what, two times, maybe three times? Yeah, you've been there for like 20, 22 days or something over in Europe. Yeah. And then you were gone for 10. Well, that was like post wedding. Yeah, but still. You know, is what it is. Still. Now married. Like... Lots of, lots of change. Oh yeah, you're married. That's a big thing. Yeah, I got a wife <laughs> or she has a husband or <laughs> she has some sort of. Something she never wanted or oh, doesn't realize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she I got married. It. Um, it was uh, absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, it's it's real. It was really exactly what I expected. Expected and nothing what I expected. I just, I just, I, I remember uh, her turning the corner as I'm waiting down there, and I just started just sobbing. I know. Um, I actually want a copy. And I haven't of your, cried in a very, very long time. I want a copy of your wedding video because it was like everything I wanted to be for like my wedding or like other people's weddings. It was just like it was comical and it was, it was, it was hard. Like it was just everything. It was every kind of emotion. And then you ended the night with Rage Against the Machine. I mean, come on. Yeah, it was a pretty damn good wedding. <laughs> um, and I, and my edict to everyone was like, look, if it goes off the fucking rails, it goes off the yeah. rails. Let's just roll with it and have a good time. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm incredibly, uh, grateful and thankful for all my friends, all my family, um, my beautiful wife, uh, who keeps me <laughs> not crazy. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, it, I forget like the things that I want to say about it. Cause it's just so like, it's, it's really raw. Cause it's like, it's like, I didn't know like people gave a shit. And it was nice to see that. And it's, and it seemed like everybody had a good time and mm -hmm. I had a very good time. My wife had a very good time, uh, you know, and she wanted to go to the V spot. After oh the yeah. Wedding, I was helping was her really get out of her dress in like the, this you know bar bathroom and this yeah, yeah, hole yeah. in the wall bar bathroom. It was amazing. My <laughs> wife at the end of the night is like, we are going to fucking V spot. And I'm like, huh, you're in a wedding dress. I'm in a tuxedo. She goes, I look like a princess and everyone will see it. And I'm like, yo, Anastasia. All right. <laughs> But they did. Everybody. So we went to, like, well, I had I had my buddy Josh from LA with <laughs> me. You were with me, <laughs> and you know my wife walks in in a wedding dress, looking absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Sits at the bar, and I looked at my buddy Josh, and I'm like, believe it or not, somebody might hit on her. <laughs> <laughs> it's I said, Northeast this is the PA. type of bar, this is the type of place where somebody might hit on her. But, yes. Um, we are coming back to you guys mm -hmm. with what I think is a true gift, um, not necessarily to you, but for us. Mm -hmm. And do you want to talk about that? what our true gift is to everybody. Well, I don't know what your true gift well, is. Well, who are our guests? Oh, sure. Um, we have the infamous Brian O'Halloran, who was the lead Dante um, in Clerks, where he got his big, you know, break, if you will. I mean, I don't know if it was a break, but it was like his first well, break. Well, it was, it was the thing that let us know that Brian O'Halloran's a nice guy. Yes, yeah. yes. And then he went on to, I mean, he is, you know, uh, an iconic character. and in, in He's most, like the Iron Man of the View Askew universe. Yes, yeah. yes, he is. He is. He's so, the Tony Stark of... He's wonderful. And yeah. I've known him, I've been friends with him for a few years now and, and he's just, he's just wonderful. Um, yeah. and then Diane, Diana, who she likes to go by, but her, her real name is Diane. Um, you know, we've worked with her and I've known her for a few years too. And she's just absolute sweetheart. I mean, they both are. So, so we, uh, uh, you know, we we obviously talk about the Viewsk universe and and Kevin and stuff like that. Kevin Smith for Kevin people because I noticed um, that we referenced a few people, so we should say Kevin is Kevin Smith. Yeah, Ernie is Ernie O'Donnell. Uh, Marilyn's Marilyn Gigliotti. Like they're all people. Excuse me from the um, Viewsk universe, but we just were calling them by their first name, and I noticed that, and I yeah, wanted like to make all, note. Like we all knew them. Yeah, well, um, we, well, do, we but do. <laughs> um, but this is the first time I met Brian. Um, uh, well, second, but. Really, the first time that really get doesn't. Talk. It was yeah. too many people there, um, and it's it's hanging out with Diana again is is just awesome because mm -hmm. she was in one of our commercials that we shot, and she was absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's 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 to me, it's incredibly informative for for all you actors out there and all you performers and artists, you know, to kind of you know hear 
you know, what they went through and, and, you know, instead of focusing on like the fan service and what does it mean and, or what Mm -hmm. is all that about or any rumors or whatever, like, you know, these, you know, uh, Brian and Dan are, you know, they're human beings too. Yeah. And and they, what we, what they've used and done with their platform is great because they're big supporters of the arts and, and just helping people and they're amazing. And they give back, man. They really Mm -hmm. give back. And I think that's really, really sweet. And hopefully we can get um, them back again. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, is that about it? And, yeah. and so we have stuff coming up in the future, right? Is there oh, yeah. good stuff coming up in the future that we're going to have on? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're going to yeah, try to be more consistent course. with this, but. Yeah. We're we going to probably some, go on some, the road too yeah. in the next few months because we have some people that can't make it to Scranton, but we're going to be able to make it to them. But there's some good guests on the horizon. Oh yeah. Some, yeah. Some big ones. Okay. All right. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, that it? Let's get to the intro. Hell Yeah. So that's what it sounded like when I was a child and I was dating my first lady. Yeah. <laughs> it was just because she was trying to drown me. It had nothing to do. It was nothing sexual. <laughs> it's just like you're a terrible person. Um, so how are you guys doing? Doing good. Terrific. Yes. Um, for everybody who, who's watching and gives a shit. Um, how do you know everybody? Uh, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I got introduced to Brian a few years ago. Actually, I met him the first time in Hamlin. <laughs> what? We had breakfast. <laughs> we had angel pancakes. Where'd you guys go? <laughs> with her dad. Yeah, oh. with my oh dad. Oh my God, Papa Toy was there? Yep. Yeah, Big Dave. Oh, what did Big Dave do? <laughs> Big Dave was all excited. He's a sweet dude. He's never seen clerks before. <laughs> <laughs> so as soon as he met him, he's like, can I do, can I see some of his movies? And of course, I have every single one. I'm like, here's Jane Silent Bob Strike Back, here's Dogma, here's Clerks, and he was just like, wow, these guys are funny, but like, you know, definitely a different kind of style. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean that, that that was revolutionary. Yeah, you know, it, was, it was. It um, was. Yes. So big, big Dave fan fan girl and didn't. No, oh, he was had no. He was telling everybody he knew him, and then we did a convention, you know, a few months li- or oh my, maybe I even a year you, after. I hope you guys remember Big Dave, or else. <laughs> oh, of course, <laughs> yeah. So that, sure. he walks into one place and he's like, "Remember me?" And you're like, "I don't know who you are." <laughs> no, <laughs> and all his friends are like, "You're a liar." I haven't met him, right? No, no, you haven't met him yet. Oh, he's the best. But at, at yeah. the diner, he was like holding court. He was like the head of that table yes, of, he's of guys the mayor. with the hunter hats oh, and yeah. all sorts of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's like, uh, like- I think they were drinking beer at breakfast, if I remember. <laughs> was you dead really? No, no my no. dad wasn't. No, everyone coffee. else probably coffee. was. But no one at the, it would, wouldn't be shocked if you saw the group of men that he was with that they were drinking beer with their pancakes. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's not- it's not. They're like- all grains. I mean, pancakes, beer, it's the same thing. <laughs> You know, they had the best angel cakes ever. Yeah. What's an angel cake? Because I'm an idiot. It was. It's like it was like gluten free and yep. wheat pancakes that they made special. Wait. But- so the hardcore drinking hunters are like, I'll have that. <laughs> well, I'm sure they just went with you know a poached. So it was like with whipped but- cream and strawberries mm-hmm. and bananas if you wanted it, and it was just like. You know, when you eat like four or five regular sized pancakes, you're like, all right, I'm full. And like for the whole morning, you're like, oh man, I'm so full. I hate these, stuck all. These, yeah, exactly. These, you'd eat a whole thing and be like, I feel full. And then you'd be like, at 20 minutes, like, I'm hungry again. Mm-hmm. They were you know good. what I mean? Like it was Chinese food of uh, breakfast. It was. It was totally the Chinese food of breakfast. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Chinese food's like, oh, I can't believe I did that. And then 30 minutes later, like, I, I, maybe I can warm up the beef and broccoli. R- right. Maybe. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how did you guys get the ham one? Well, we had a mutual friend who's also uh, a local indie filmmaker and he connected us together because he was friends with Dave and I was friends with, or his name is Dave, but I was friends with Dave and Dave was friends with Brian and we all just met up the one day he introduced us all. So we all had breakfast but together. But you, you guys weren't living in the in that area at that time, no, right? No, no, no. What happened was uh, Dave uh, Madison, who uh, wrote a film called uh, Mr. Hush, he, yep. he lives in the uh, Pike County area. He, uh, he was hosting his own horror convention called uh, Mr. Hush Weekend of Fear. Uh, And so uh, I had met him at the Erie Film and Horror uh, Convention quite a few years ago. And um, so he introduced me. uh, You know, I I was, he was really cool. He was friendly. uh, He was a filmmaker. He wanted me to be part of his next film. And so uh, he invited me up. I was living in New York City at the time. He invited me up to his place uh, with his family, stay up in uh, Pike County. 
And then uh, he was like, I'm going to be doing this horror con. Would you be, mind being a guest and things like that? And then we just developed a relationship, uh, a friendship uh, and professional friendship as well, where then I would come up and, you know, uh, spend Fourth of July up there uh, for a party or whatever and stuff like that. So I think most people think that, like, just because people are like, oh, I, they're famous, that they don't know how to go to a barbecue. Oh, no, yeah. right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where they're like, yeah. what do you mean you're, fr-? it's like, mm-hmm. yo, they, they go to the bathroom too. Yeah. Right? I mean, everybody yeah. does. <laughs> well, I mean, we literally just dropped someone off at the Scranton airport the other day. Are you kidding me? No, I swear to God. And so literally <laughs> within, vodka. within a minute of being at Avaca, which I don't know, it sounds like an Italian it's a restaurant. Vodka, but it's, it's weird. It's, exactly. I think it's actually a, a, a Irish because right. there's, there's a town in Ireland called Avoca. Uh, and so, uh, as we were leaving, Diane goes, oh my God. I'm like, what's the matter? And through messenger, some fan contacted me. By the way, he did contact me. Just my messenger didn't ping uh, uh, through Facebook. Go, were you just at Scranton Airport? Otherwise, you have a you have a, like a doppelganger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I have. So, I, it, so right I was away. driving to Dixon City. So she wrote back. Yeah, I was. I, I was like, oh well. I'm like, um, yeah. Um, I'm like, we just dropped off a friend who's flying back to Denver. And he's like, I thought that was you. He's like, oh, that totally made my day. Made the hour long wait for my mother's flight to come in worthwhile. And then I started like chatting with him back and forth. And this is somebody you never met. Never met. And he happened to see us or him, Brian. And uh, I'm not even friends with him on Facebook. So and he just messaged me on Facebook. Go, go, in, like, go in there. Like, how important is it? Um you know, after, after all these years to, to, to just stay connected to people and keep your humanity and not have. Well, listen, you, you make it sound like we're always jet setting off to Paris. Well, I know. Like, Lisbon. Now, you know what it is? We're everyday people. Yeah. Because we have life every day. And then every once in a while we have moments of a lot of fun where we get together with a lot of creatives and we make either podcasts or we do uh, great television episodes or we do films or we do um, we do plays or stage plays whatever it is um and so those are the moments that people see us and remember us because we're we're you know indelibly put onto films that people love and enjoy and especially with kevin usually making a really uh, a good film every couple of years when he right. comes out with one you know and now we have the new jay and silent bob reboot coming out this october so it just keeps it fresh in the mind again you know the guys uh you know, Bill and Ted are doing shooting right now down in New Orleans for their new one. And I can't wait for and that. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, reminiscent kind of reboots and part twos and where are they now kind of things uh, to that, that kind of world that keeps those characters in people's minds. How did, how did, how did, how did you two, are you, were you two sweethearts from a young age? Um, yes. No, uh, I was younger. Just met her no, last week. Uh, <laughs> we've been, we've been together just around the time when Clerks got finished. And we were about to go to Sundance. So we met in October of, of 93. 93. Holy and then, shit. And then we started dating in November of 93. Yeah, exactly a month later. Yeah. I met him at a community theater that I was brand new to acting. Right. I had been dating this local guy in New Jersey who was involved in this theater. We dated about a year. And while I was dating him, we did a play together. And it was just because I was his girlfriend. You know, he got me involved. But I was secretly really excited to right. be doing this play. It totally sucked. The show sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was the worst production. I don't even... What What was the name of the show? I wasn't in it. I know, but you knew what the, the show Burger was. King. It yeah. was. I don't remember what the name of... Um, oh, it was called The Desperate Hours. It was, a, uh, yeah. it was a play that was set in like the 1950s. So like the jargon and everything was 50s. But, hey, yo. but here's the thing that was so hilarious. There were a lot of characters. Right. And there were two sets. One was like the police station and one was the home where the bad guy was holding the family hostage. Right. Okay. Spoiler alert. <laughs> oh, shit. We never interact with the police. The police never come to the house and, we, and, the, and the people who are at the house never go to the police station. So during rehearsals... We never interacted, and, and apparently the director never discussed with the two groups. When it opened on opening night, the police was set in the 1950s, and we were set in current day. Nobody so, ever- so, so the whole audience is like, what? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's like Chief Wiggum coming to the door. See here. Yeah. You two are under arrest, eh? For all the mismanagement of the prone chairs, eh? Uh, now you two boyos get against the wall. And you there with the gams, you get up against the wall as well, see? 
<laughs> and then the modern day is like, go fuck yourself. Oh, yeah. oh, fuck. <laughs> don't, don't touch me. Don't touch me. I have rights. <laughs> yeah. So do you have a warrant? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that, that was, that was the worst. And then literally like a week or so later, the guy and I broke up and, uh, because was, of the play and the bad yeah. reviews, the bad reviews <laughs> and the bad reviews. Yeah, this science fiction play makes no sense. Yeah, <laughs> so we yeah, so we broke up. So this is like by this point, it's like the ending of May, June ninety three, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, I'm never going to go back to that theater. You know, whatever. You know, and there's then, others, right? But no, I know, oh, okay. I know, but I made a, a bunch of really nice friends there. So in in like I don't know September. So like a couple months later, I kind of go there and I kind of keep a low profile because I don't know how well I'll be received and everybody was so happy to see me and they were like oh my god are you going to do more shows I'm like well I kind of just did this show because I was dating Eric and they're like no you were really good and bam I got I, sta I was stage directing something right away no and shit they cast me in this British thriller called um, Angel Street and I had to have an English accent and I was so nervous and it was like so important to me. So I got off book before the very first day of rehearsal. I practiced my accent and everything. And it turns out they were going to have my ex-boyfriend in the show with me. No. Yeah. So I was like, oh man, this is going to be drama. This is how Angelina yeah. Jolie feels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> turns out he couldn't do it. So first couple of rehearsals, we don't have that, that role filled. Right. And then, um, one day I show, I'm at rehearsal, not not rehearsal for the, our show. I'm stage managing the other show and the director pulls me into a room and she's like, oh, I want you to meet the actor who's going to be playing the inspector. And it was Brian. No shit. Yeah. So I was like, hey, nice to meet you. Blah, blah, blah. You know, I make some chit chat and I'm like, look, I got to go. I got to take, you know, stage directions and stuff. And I walk out of the room and apparently after I walked out of the room, what did you say, Brian? Uh, who was that girl? <laughs> you said something else oh she's you, cute you said i think i'm gonna like doing this show. yeah i think I'm gonna do this. <laughs> that's great well what it is is uh, uh, angel street is the stage play version of the film gaslight which a lot of people in the world have been quoting gaslighting gaslighting yeah uh it's uh, actually the first film that uh, angela, angela lansbury, lansbury ever played no uh, shit yeah, i really? played the role that she played in so, that film that was her first role so uh, if you want to see a great old movie uh, called uh, Gaslight is the movie, and it's a great movie. It got nominated for awards and stuff. So this was the play version of that. So I played this uh, English detective, this older English de detective. Um, so I did this show, and uh, during the rehearsal process, it was very nice getting to know Diane and, and stuff like that, although there, she was uh, seeing a lot of gentlemen callers come to the play. <laughs> I, well, she's hot. Look at her. Right. So there were times where hey I was man, like, hey, man, however you can get yes. dinner. Yeah. So I was just like, there's no way she's going to hook up with some some guy like me, she's got, look at all these guys coming every night. One guy with a big bouquet of roses. On opening night. I wasn't even guy. dating the guy and he showed up with two dozen pink tea roses. And I'm like, oh my God. Because yeah. every time I came to the theater. Boy, does he wish he threw yeah. those in the garbage. Yeah. <laughs> 40 bucks gone to, yeah. to waste there, buddy. Oh, those had to be more than 40 bucks. So, so uh, I mean, you, you kind of accidentally, I wouldn't say accidentally, kinda. you just, you just, you, you got, you got the bug bit you when you weren't expecting it. How did you get into to performing. Uh, what I got into theater was um, I used to do it. Uh, my bro I have two older brothers, one six years older, one nine years older. And the one who's uh, six years older than me, uh, he would do plays and stuff. And uh, when I was a kid, like third grade, I did like, you know, the, the local talent, you know, the, the, the school, the middle school talent show and stuff like that, where I was cast as like the Mad Hatter and right. like uh, in the, the, what am I losing my mind? Mad Hatter is from, Alice, Alice Wonderland, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, went on to do like small plays like that. I did like background stuff for uh, Fiddler on the Roof when my brother was in it and stuff like that. Uh, and then when I got to high school, I really didn't do much in high school. I was part of drama club, but I never did, went and did the plays until I was in my senior year in which I did the two shows senior year. So I did Snoopy, uh, which was a musical, which I got the lead of Snoopy. And then uh, we, we played Snoopy. I did. I did. <laughs> this dog of a face. I think it was the nose that got it really. Um, <laughs> And so uh, we went from there and we did um, Bye Bye Birdie was another play we did in high school. And then I graduated and then um, I didn't really do anything. I went to like a community college in New Jersey for a year and took all like, you know, stage building and uh, set design. Did and you have a major like at the time or? Uh, no, because it was like, a, you know, a county community college. Right, right. So um, 
Uh, as I was going through that, I was like, oh, getting a degree doesn't get you acting gigs. You got to just go out and do it. <laughs> so from there, um, I started to just audition. To that was local, a great Ian McKellen, local, by the way. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, so then I would uh, audition at local community theaters. And um, there was a time where uh, I was, I worked, I stopped altogether acting and then started working. And then uh, I was just bitching with my friends. Like we'd see something on TV or whatever. I'm like, that guy's awful. And they're like, why don't you go and do some acting then Mr. Fucking shit. So awful. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, my one friend, uh, he actually, that down. he Mr. actually, shit so, awful. Uh, so my one friend found an audition at local community <laughs> theater. It was for a production of Dracula. Uh, so I went down there my three friends followed me just to see this or either goof on me afterwards or go like, all right, see, this is what you should be doing. And uh, I auditioned. They had me call. Wh- wh- which theater was, the, was the very f- first the one? The very first was First Avenue Playhouse. Oh, they did it first and then you did it at Meadow? Correct. Okay. Uh, and I so like I, competitive playhouses. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was. It's that kind of, especially in Monmouth County, New Jersey. There no, is. only because the second the second time we played Redenfield was when I met him. Right. When we were in rehearsal when I was first acting and I got to see him play Redenfield. And then the third time he did it was with me. Right. At first day, so I was Where, once awesome. again, I also played Renfield the Lunatic. So I'd gotten the role. This is before I met Diane. This was like 90, 91 when I got the first time started doing community theater regularly and stuff like that. And then it went really well. And then I was doing, you know, Charlotte's Web. I was Templeton the Rat. There was a, a play of called uh, The Dresser in which I was the co-lead in that. And then another one called Sleuth uh, and a bunch of others. So uh, it, I was doing really well, getting really great local press coverage. And very diverse roles. Yeah, exactly. And then I did a couple of musicals here and there. Um, I right, did, no uh, comedies really. Yeah. It was no, all heavy drama. I was always like the, the evil kind of antagonist or right. the henchman or whatever. It was never really the the comi- comedic kind of like, oh, here I am. Did you actually, <laughs> did, you did wait until dark, right? I did wait until dark with Marilyn Gigliotti from Clerks. Because that was your audition piece for- For Clerks. Right. Clerks. Right. Mm-hmm. And he is the killer. Well, the, you don't realize he's the guy who's- Manipulating. Ma- ma- <laughs> manipulating. Well, I, I mean, Quentin Tarantino did a re- uh, revival of, on Broadway about ten years ago about it too. Really? So I didn't. Playing that oh, role. really? Yeah, yeah. So, and the Marissa Tomei great, was in yeah, it. Yeah, it was a. It's a. It's a great. I was that, still in the- That's another movie. Uh, Alan Arkin was the role I played in the movie version of Wait Until Dark, uh, which was in the early seventies or late sixties. I forget. Um, so I was on this role of doing a lot of plays, and then the theater, the First Avenue Playhouse, in which I had worked out of. Um, the the owner and producer of the playhouse this is before cell phones and the internet uh called and uh called my house and said hey these guys are auditioning uh people for this film they're going to be doing in a month um you should come down and audition the auditions are like in a month um i'm like okay cool uh it wasn't a big deal at the time it it wasn't a big deal no no it was just they're auditioning auditioning. some local guys (coughs) want to make a film and you're in the age range of what they're looking for so I was doing another show at another theater at the time. So the month goes by, the Sunday goes by. By the Monday morning, I get a call at my house again. It's the guy going, Joe, going, hey, Brian, I thought you were going to come down to audition. Where were you last night? And I'm like, oh, I totally forgot about that. Is it still going on? He goes, yeah, tonight again. I was like, what do they need? They want you to bring a monologue and then your headshot. I'm like, okay, cool. So I went down there not knowing really what I was auditioning for. I mean, I could have been auditioning for porn for all I know. And yeah. In a way, it kind of was in a dirty sense of the, the, the <laughs> m- mouth porn, if you want to say. Because um, filthy, filthy language, Brian, as my yeah, mother even, would say. Yeah, but even even at that time, who the fuck makes a movie for 30-some grand? Well, mm. A, they didn't know they are going to be spending 28, 9, whatever. Um, they were planning on just spending 20. Um, and I didn't know what it was all about. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I auditioned, did this piece. I took a, a dialogue from uh, Wait Until Dark and made it a monologue piece. Auditioned with it. If anyone has the 10-year anniversary of Clerks, uh, Clerks X, the black box version, there is the auditions on the DVD. Oh, entry. no shit. The actual yeah, audition. so you'll oh, see the actual awesome. auditions. So I auditioned for it, um, did that monologue. Two days later, I get a call back. We go to the, the rec center in the Highlands. Uh, to to do the uh, the callbacks, I'm just opposite Kevin for that. We're we're reading the dialogue from the original clerks of the uh, independent contractors from the Death Star, and he's like, "Well, what do you think?" I'm like, "Oh, it's uh, pretty funny." Uh, I mean, the other guy's really funny, and this guy's funny too. And I was like, "Who are they in the film?" Because the night I auditioned, I had asked how many principal roles are they, and they said they're sixth, but they're six, but we already have them cast. I was like, "Okay," so they were just auditioning day players and and um, you know uh, other extras, so to speak. And so um, I go, that's great. I'd love to do this role. Who, who are they in the play and in the film? And he's like, well, the film's called Clerks, and these are the two clerks. One's a convenience store clerks, and one's a video store clerks. 
Uh, um, by the way, kids, uh, ask your grandparents what a video store clerk was. Anyway, so um, <laughs> it's true. So they were uh, wizards. So I was like, but I was told that you'd already cast. He goes, yeah, don't worry about that. And so we went on from there. Ah, the process. Yeah, and so then uh, I came back again to read opposite Marilyn Gigliotti to see chemistry of, of the Dante character with the women and it, and it kind of worked. And we then rehearsed for a month at the store, um, the dialogue just to get that snappy cause it's a mouthful sometimes right. Kevin's uh, dialogue. And uh, he was very fortunate to cast certain theater actors because we have to memorize entire plays before um, you can actually, I think uh, the theater actors are the superstars of the, mm-hmm. of the acting community. Well, if you're going to give a mouthful of dialogue, especially that's the all I just, it. it's yeah. terrifying to me. Yeah. And, and I, then, and then the rest of this history. I mean, like, what was what was the so were you, so you guys actually met each other after photography was after done. after photography was done. So then that's done. Those guys are we were filming in the spring of ninety three. He was editing all through the summer uh, of ninety three with Steenbeck's too. Yeah, you guys shot on black and white film, yeah. Right? That's raw sixteen mil film, and then you know cutting it and taping it literally, and then sending it to a processing house to then take all that and put it into an actual full uh new reel of film so yeah so they auditioned they they edited they um uh submitted it to the new york uh feature film market a film festival in manhattan that doesn't even exist anymore uh and we had a, we got accepted and we had a screening on a sunday at 11 o'clock on the last day of the festival do you still have any idea in your head like what no, this world is no not at all not really i mean not the film festival circuit kind of thing that Did was you see the film before uh, he had given us VHS copies of the film uh, with all the footage on it. Not nothing really edited. So like all out. the dailies. No, 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 not oh, dailies. Like the, but I mean, like cut. his his yeah his first <clears throat> initial like this is the film, this giant thing with the original ending, no less. And so I had shown my, Diane and my mom and her sister and her boyfriend at the time at my house in a VHS, and you know, and here we were, we watched it before this screening was. So no, no, uh, was it after? No, no, you guys had the screening in October, right? That's when the... Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So, yeah. The, so, the screening in New York happens. There's like 20 people in the theater, 12 of which are us from right. the film. <laughs> One person I remember that distinctly... He's not exaggerating. No, I remember reading, yeah. I remember yeah. seeing the story. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, then there was, was the... was Bob Hawk, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I love Bob, Bob Hawk. Hawk. Bob Hawk, mm-hmm. who was in there, uh, who was fortunate enough to come out and really like it and then suggest it to Amy Taubin of The Village Voice, which doesn't exist anymore. And then she went around to say to people like, you know, she had a relationship with Harvey Weinstein and the Weinstein Company or Miramax at the time to go, hey, you should take a look at this film. I think this is something that is right in your vein of an independent kind of counterculture kind of film. And then um, they tried to make, you know, deals before even Sundance came around. But in the meantime, Bob Hawke said, you guys should go to Sundance with this film. I, I would put a recommendation for it. And so then he did. He put a recommendation for us to go to Sundance. We got accepted. We had four screenings at Sundance, and uh, they all got sold out before the festival even started, which is a very rare thing to happen. For this little engine. Little engine that could, because Amy Taubin wrote this great article in The Village Voice about it, and people in New York had the buzz about it, which got to L.A., and then they were like, what? And, you know, so everybody's like, we got to see this film. It's going to be the buzz of the festival, apparently. And then the first... uh, Two screenings happened. I hadn't gone even out there yet. I had had to cobble together money in which Diane even helped me. And like, well, I'll pay for your flight then. That, you know, I'll lend you the money for the flight to get you out there. Meanwhile, we had just started dating like literally months earlier. Right. So, uh, also think and, there people, and there was a blizzard. And there was a blizzard, Yeah, but I also think, you know, because one of the things that like we like to do on this too, because we had Stacy's friend Jack on here is mm-hmm. like, Here's really what it is behind the scenes, you know, where it's like, yeah, yeah, it's you not. Got, you got to string some money together. Correct. Yeah, I mean, it's I was, not like no. you're making a movie, so just let's throw money at no, it. No, no, not at all. I mean, uh, I, I was doing odd jobs at the time and stuff. You know, I've I've worked uh, as a roofer for a short period of time, a home uh, painter. I worked for uh, as a um, uh, a loader and unloader of tractor trailer trucks. I mean, oh. I've worked I've worked a lot of odd jobs. Um, you know, I worked for a supermarket chain, the ShopRite chain for four years. And that's when I, when I left that, I was already in management. And, uh, when I left that, my mom flipped, you know, like what, you know, this is crazy. Back, they have yeah. a pension. <laughs> there wasn't that. It was like, you know, uh, my, my mom was like, Jesus Christ. Do you know that's so, why would you leave that? Everybody needs to eat. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. She's from Ireland, by the way. Um, I'm the only one born here. My two brothers, my two, my father and mother, they're all born I was just Ireland. there three weeks ago. Yeah. So, uh, she flipped out when I was went on to do acting then as the full-time kind of gig. Um, 
But I think but it I mean, kind, of, that, kind of worked out. I mean, do you think people just don't see, I mean, people, especially the people that love us, like they want us to be lawyers, doctors. And then when we're like, well, we really, really like this thing. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, yeah. look, I was more than capable of doing that job at ShopRite. I mean, I was very, in the management program, I was doing really well. Even in the under, other departments, I was the top in the company to do those, those departments. I knew how to order and buy and, and market and all this other stuff. And I could do it. I could do it in my sleep, but it was my soul. It was like soul crushing. It was right. just like, I'm not happy here. I you know I can, I, I feel like I should be doing something else. Like literally when I was a seafood manager for the seafood department of any of the stores I was in, I would then do on air, live on air commercials for the department. So I'd get Over on the, the loudspeaker. Yeah. No shit. No. Ah, really? Listen yeah, yeah, to yeah, this. Yeah. So I would be like, you know, <laughs> let's say there was something uh, like, shrimp were on sale. So I would give like, hey, everybody, this is Popeye, the scaler man. <laughs> and we got a whale of a sale over at the seafood department. We got shrimps on sale, four ninety nine a pound, 21 to 31 count. And you just go see Brian about it and he'll take care of you. And don't forget the spinach. Ah, go, 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 go. You know what I mean? <laughs> Holy shit. Seriously. And then in, there, at in the your, time. In your local supermarket. Yeah. And then at the time, like the Cajun cook was the big thing. That yeah, got, yeah, yeah. And they'd be like, ooh, we got catfish here at the seafood department. Bum and I, it's a wonder massage guarantee. You get yourself a little onion and some garlic and get yourself some shallots and then we put a little white wine all over that. And you have a gumbo and some catfish and black onions. I guarantee you have your mama smacking your mouth. It's so good. You know, and people are like, what the hell is going on in this store? And so we had management would come over. I'm like, um, who's this? Who, what's going on? We're like, oh. <laughs> That's the night guy, and uh, that's the night manager, Brian. He's uh, he's doing everything. It's like, well, oh, these are great. So then they'd made me do voiceover stuff for stores on tape to send to the other stores. No shit. Yeah, so then I would do, like, the the wash ladies, uh, the fishwives from Monty Python. Oh, look, there's a penguin on the telly. So I'd be like, oh, look, we have scrawled cod for sale this week in the seafood department. Just ask the lovely boy, Brian, about it. He'll wrap you up a couple of pounds of lovely scrawled cod card and don't forget the lemon butter sauce with that. It's an awful lovely thing. Where we gotta go, we gotta find some penguins. to da <laughs> So these are the type of things that, yes, I could do that job in an instant and not a problem. I but mean, were you doing just, those things just to be like, oh, this is so I don't take a bridge? Well, yes. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pretty much. It was kind of just like my creative outlet and yeah. stuff like that. Now, granted, with my friends, we uh, we table gamed. We role played. You know, D&D, Space opera, villains, vigilantes, DC heroes, uh, Middle Earth, things like that. Um, so the creative acting aspect of doing things I, I did with friends while gaming. We would do a whole weekend of just, you know, table gaming. And this is before like the video game craze went as high as it has yeah. gone. The technology wasn't even there at that time. I mean, we had a, an Atari 5200. I had a Commodore 64 back I had in one the day. Of those. <laughs> and so, you know, it's that type of era where table, table gaming and role playing was still going on in the 80s, early 90s. And so, I mean, they still do now. People are really enjoying it now. But that's was that was my creative outlet back in the time when I was just working. So once the community theater gigs started to to happen, and I was getting those outlets, and then but also getting recognition in the local press um, for my work that it was good, and it was like, wow, he's really you know intense at what he does and stuff like that. Is there something to be said for that, where you're actually somebody you don't know says something kind about you, and it kind of reaffirms like. Maybe not everybody understands my decision, but at least I think mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going the right way. Right. And I mean, and, and especially <laughs> once then Clerks gets picked up at Sundance and then people were like, we get it, you know, because we always thought it was just a very Jersey centric kind of comedy, Jersey centric kind of uh, male kind of humor to it that yeah, a few people will get it, but not everybody. But when a lot of people started getting it and this was the age of VHS tape and tape rentals uh grand yes ask your grandparents about that kids um <laughs> yes we actually had to go out in the snow uphill both ways <laughs> to get vhs copies of films that we wanted to see <laughs> so um when those sales started to happen and you know things like you know we would be at a, me and jeff were at a and diane and, and uh, lisa were at a uh videotape convention where producers and 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 people who created films wanted to get sales of why don't i remember lisa VHS. being there was she there I, don't, I thought she was anyway so we go it was the 90s man. yeah no so wait so this this convention this thing that brian just described was in the catskills yeah it was at the um 
uh, what's the name of that resort? One of the famous resorts in the Catskills. Right. It kind of looks like the, the anyway. The, the Shining. The, the Shining. Shining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Totally. Oh, the Concord. <laughs> it was the Concord Inn up in the Catskills. Concord. The VHS and, convention. Yeah. yeah. So it was. It was like That's the tape so sale cool. convention. So we had one of the uh, this blockbuster. This is like 95 Yeah, we had one of the blockbuster um, executives come up. Do you know your movie is the most unreturned and stolen movie in our fan base? <laughs> And I was like, well, that's our fan base, a bunch yeah. of cheap thieves. So would you like to order 20 more cases, sir? Yeah. <laughs> and it was that type of thing that was handed around by parties to parties. And then we even actually had when the um, 94, I think it was. Yeah, the 94 was the 25th anniversary, I think, of, of um, yeah, it was. It was the 25th anniversary of Woodstock. Yeah. And so at night when there were no bands at like one in the morning still playing, they would show movies and- Clerks was one of the movies oh, they showed. They did a Woodstock so 94. Cool. Yeah. 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 That's so cool. That so, wasn't the fire one. No, it wasn't no. the fire one. No, he wasn't blowing people for that. No. One, no. <laughs> but we would we would have to get the movie out there if we had to. I mean, so they told me. Anyway, um, so uh yeah, so we had a lot of like, you know, a really big kind of cool like recognition for that. And then uh Universal came in and wanted to do Mall Rats with Kevin, and we we did Mall Rats where we got people like uh, some dude named Ben Affleck involved and uh <laughs> Who knows? And, uh, who's that guy? Shannon, <laughs> Shannon Doherty, and then Michael Rooker, and all these really great people who were on, you know, had nice careers on their own, but they were a part of what we were doing, and it was really fun to do that. And we went on from there to do Chasing Amy, and then Dogma, which was his the, the film he really always wanted to get done. Yeah, mm-hmm. I love Dogma. I, I, mm-hmm. something might have to be revealed by me. Yeah. Oh no! You, you worked at Dogma in, in Pittsburgh? <laughs> no, no, I'm secretly Bruce Jenner. Um, uh-huh. I, oh God! I it wasn't until about a couple of weeks ago that I re, I didn't realize the effect that that film, your performance in that writing, had to do with my life. And I, and I know it sounds crazy, but I go back and I look, and I'm like, I really I went and saw Mallrats in the theater. I saw Chasing Amy in the theater. Mm. I I read the script for Dogma like a year and a half before it came out, and before film school. How'd somehow, you do that? It leaked, somehow it leaked <laughs> on this weird website and I read it. Um, and it, it really influenced a lot of the things that I have now. And he doesn't fangirl very often. No, I, but I'm not like, I'm not like, drop, I'm your, kind tr- of drop your trousers, it's time. I'm, I just, I just, I just, maybe I wanted to say thank you. No, not at all. I mean, uh, that's definitely one of his... Uh, but well, but but I don't care what you write. It, 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 the people got to perform it, and if and if correct, and if, yeah, and I and I get that, and I, and I was very uh, I I enjoyed uh, playing Grant Hicks, the news reporter in that film, and I got to work with one of my comedic idols, George Carlin, at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, got to talk to Alan Rickman at the time as well. I in a very just in a very, we're all you know, we're all the same, we're all just the same associates in the same work environment right now. And it was a lot of fun and it's memories I will always have. I, I had, um, at the time, uh, George Carlin had come out with the book brain droppings. And so, uh, I had bought it all knowing that I was going to be going out to Pittsburgh where we shot it to then have him sign it. Uh, so we were both in the makeup chair. It was like day two, I think of the entire production. We shot all the Catholicism. Wow. Outside of this. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So he's in his makeup chair getting his, you know, Cardinal Glick outfit makeup being put on. I'm getting my uh, Grant Hicks news reporter <laughs> um, stuff on. And we were done. And he was very friendly. So where are you from, son? And I'm like, I'm from the Bronx. Originally, we're in the same neighborhood you were from. And he's like, well, no way. <coughs> so then we're talking about the Bronx and how we went to, you know, St. Raymond's and all these other schools like Cardinal Hayes and all these other schools in the Bronx. And I told him how I went to Holy Family in the Bronx and stuff like that. So we're just chit-chatting and stuff like that. And I said, um, Ms. Carlin, you don't mind if uh, if you can sign this copy of your book? He's like, oh, you bought one of my books. That's great. Now, at the time. <laughs> oh, you're the guy. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you're the one. Uh, so at the time, um, you know, uh, hair and makeup and costume people do what's called continuity photographs. And yep. when you're done, they take a picture of you to make sure this is how you started out makeup wise, how you clothing wise and stuff like that. And at the time, I mean, normally throughout the years, it's always been Polaroids. You have Mm -hmm. right then and there. And now, obviously, it's all digital. But back then, Polaroid was coming out with these like skinny strip ones. They weren't the full size one. It was like, so that was the cameras they were using. So I was like, do you mind if we take a photo together? And and the the girl's like, absolutely, not a problem. So she took a photo with this strip. So I have a small strip, me as as, uh, Grant Hicks and him as Cardinal Gleck. 
And so he signed the the Polaroid, but then he, in the book he signed from one Bronx boy to another. <gasps> Keep him laughing, George Carlin. Oh. And so I now have that photo strip uh, Polaroid as the bookmark in that book. And it's one of my like treasured kind of any type of memorabilia I had. And I remember because it was weird. So fast forward years later, I'm in Pittsburgh for a horror convention and it was the night he had passed. And I, oh. and uh, I usually keep the radio on in the hotel room just to fall asleep to like white noise almost right, just right. Head, and it's like news radio, whatever. And I remember it was like two in the morning cause it was like LA time. I think it was like 11 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night when he had passed. And I just was like, what? And I remember texting Kevin immediately going, have you heard? He goes, yes. And he's like, I'm absolutely devastated. I'm in the process of writing a piece for a Vanity Fair or Variety or one of those. And so I was just a mess that whole weekend. But um, he is definitely uh, missed. Uh, and But his stuff is extremely relevant, especially in the day and age that we're living in now. Um, to see, you know, I bought all of his, they, they have a, some really tremendous box sets now of all of his work, including his early television appearances on different talk shows. Um, and when you watch his, him work and just, A, not only it was great to watch him work on dogma, but when you got to watch him work, when he did his stand up, especially his specials, and he was just such on a higher level of comic thought oh. and just social awareness thought too, that it was just incredibly uh, awesome that I had just that brief scintilla of a millennium to, to work with him. That uh, it's someone who I always like, man, Carlin was the best. And that's, that's what I've always loved. Now they have that whole saying, don't meet your heroes. Yeah, I know yeah. it was totally worth it. It was totally worth it. I mean, he was he was on the the, the health kick at the time. He he drank wine. That was his only uh, outlet. Uh, but wine was healthy, from what the doctors would say to him. Uh, you know, because they did. They they still today like glass of red that, wine. That glass of red wine, right? Oh, it's the tannins. It's really good. Um, and so uh, it's that type of thing that I'm just like, man, if I could achieve like not even a one hundredth of what that guy is, or even just think on a level of him that he was. And uh, it's it's sad at the same time that he's gone, but at the same time, he is kind of like the Obi-Wan in the in the back, just floating, like guiding people. Like, oh, be controversial. Push the envelope. But, you know, when you think about him, like his, it, like anything that he said was that was considered controversial, you look at now and it was like, that seemed kind of common sense. Uh, he was on the yeah. right side of history every All single the time. time. Every time. Okay. And I was a little like his last special. I'm like, oh, he's mad. He's really pissed. Yeah, because, you know, we weren't standing up to our end of the bargain as the right. citizenry. The citizenry, we're, we're, le we're letting our power go to these uh, politicians who are just like, they're, they're never going to vote us out. We're <laughs> too powerful. Blah, 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 blah. We got to get to our country clubs now. Blah, 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 blah. That was a great, I, Mitch, I, was I, a great I, Mitch McConnell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But I mean, it's those type of things like people protesting outside their offices. That's not what you protest. You know where you protest? You protest where rich people gather. You go to the docks of their boats. Yep. You go to their. You go to the the country clubs. You go to the very fancy restaurants. You don't have to go inside and scream at them as they're trying to eat their ta their tacos or their filet mignon. Don't know you're there. But the, but at mm -hmm. the same time, just be outside. And eventually, you know, patrons are like, yeah, we really don't want to let this guy in because then those guys come in and now they're screaming at us while other people are trying to eat their food and we're just mm -hmm. trying to make a buck. So it's those type of uh, protests and, and get out and vote. Every vote counts. I don't care who you are. I don't care how young you are. Like, I don't care. I'm worried about what's going to happen with the Walking Dead episodes. No, no, no. <laughs> you know what's going to happen to the Walking Dead episodes? It's going to be real life outside because we're not going to be able to feed our own people. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> don't worry about what's That's going true. on with the Walking Dead. Get out there and vote. It's only once every two to four years that we ask you to come out and vote. Just pay attention for at least the two months leading up to elections and vote. Wow, this got political real quick. No, 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 no. Because, because, well, I mean, there's TiVo. You can vote for one day. You can watch Walking Dead tomorrow, even though you missed it exactly. last night. Yeah. It's true, not true. a big yeah. deal. True, mm -hmm. true. I mean, do you find, I mean, look, you get to, you, you get to see, I'm sure both of you get to see this where it's like, you see the people at the, at the top of their game and, and the people who aren't necessarily, you know, like there's nothing wrong with, with community theater, theater, anything like that. I mean, everybody's just struggling just to, you know, Absolutely. Listen. Follow what they love and not take the bridge. Here's mm -hmm. the f here's the fact. Uh, to get a SAG card, to be part of the Screen Actors Guild, you got to do a lot. 
it's, you know, there's a lot of, there's usually you have to do four SAG films. Two, you get Taft Heart lead. And then by the third or fourth film, you have to join. And now I, I forget how much the dues are to join the initiation. I think it's like over two grand now. Yeah. Um, I, think, I, th- I think when I joined, it was just over a thousand. Right. But now the both yeah. unions are together. Correct. SAG after, after, SAG yeah. after yeah. it together, which uh, Before after. Before it was, you had union dues for both. Yeah. The, yeah it, I was there the last mm-hmm. time they collectively yeah. bargained. Correct. For, cause, uh, so for those who don't know, after is the American Federation of uh, television and radio performers, uh, artists. Yes. And so, and then SAG is Screen Actors Guild. So they were the television and radio people, had their own union. And then we were film and television people, kind of weird, weirdly enough, in SAG. So they merged together, rightfully so. It, it's a cost-effective measure, yada, yada, yada. So um, uh, f- uh, anybody who's lucky enough to have that card, at any given moment, only 15% of the union members are working at any time. 85% of the wow. actual membership are, are, unemployed. are, are unemployed, yep. are looking wow. to get work. Because, yep. they, you know, you could be, look, I could be a Screen Actor Guild uh, after card holding member, but I have a regular job. And if I can, and if I'm lucky enough to get into an audition and do, you know, get a role and or do background work, whatever it is, and then you're still a union member, you still have to pay dues. And, you know, and then out of that 15%, only like one half of 1% are the, you know, Sylvester Stallone, the Brad Pitts, the, the Brad Pitts mm-hmm. right. And, you know, and they, they bring in a, a majority of, cause you, a percentage of your earnings goes to the union. Right. And then that's your union dues and blah, 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 blah. So, and then producers pay into the pension mm-hmm. and health and pension by hiring union people and stuff like that. And that's how the union and how, how they survive. But even as a union member working, as an actor, you have to make a certain amount of money in acting, SAG acting gigs to then qualify for their health care, which you then still have to pay your premiums for. So it's not like these movie people, they got it we're so made. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't. It, you don't realize some people are literally working, even just background, just to continually accumulate the money requirement to just keep their health care. Well, I think there's this misconception that if I've seen you in more than one thing, the other times you're in a yacht. Correct. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Or you're producing I mean, something. How, or well, here's I mean, a perfect how, example. His mother, all these years, mm-hmm. everyone that she knows, she works at the Hilton Hotel. Mm-hmm. They all think like that he's a, that Brian is a millionaire, and yeah, why she, hasn't and he bought her a house? Yeah. You know, like oh, why? You know, why are you still working here? Why? Why hasn't your son bought I'm your not, house? Yeah, but you're not. I'm not Jay Z. <laughs> yeah, but you're not. Well, who is? Yeah. yeah. But you're not. You're, I mean, there's a guy that went from sling and rock to being the yeah. most. Yeah, and I mean, I, I guess good Alleged, for him. Allegedly, I guess good for him. Yes, of course, yeah. good for but, him. But but I mean, how many? I mean, I mean, just if you just if you look at like the 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 view is universe. Mm-hmm. I mean, n- I don't think people realize it's like, man, you were like I said before when you I said, hey, we're just blue collar filmmakers. Stop yelling at me. <laughs> I mean, you guys really are. You're the ones who who really grind and and care and give a shit and and work your asses mm-hmm. off. Meanwhile, you know, Taylor Swift's dad's like the CEO of Kraft. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, and the same thing. I mean, even Ben Affleck made fun of it. I believe it was in um, either Dogma or the Jane Silent Bob Strikes Back, where he's like, you know, you you work and you do the art films. You know, you do the big multi yeah. you know, action mm-hmm. films, and then you. <laughs> pay dues by doing the non-paying small art film. Right. And when you're that level of an actor, you, you can, can do that. You can do that. Or you can go and direct your own small kind of passion piece and stuff like that where you're not paying yourself at all just to just to get your story out there. And there are a lot of filmmakers and a lot of actors in these independent films that are exactly that. They're just doing it. They're volunteering their time. People are volunteering their skill set, either making food for the film or whatever. Or, oh, I got lights. Or, oh, so-and-so's got a barn. Or, hey, man, you need a location at a store. So-and-so's really will we'll give you a store or a bar to to shoot in and stuff like that. And it's a lot of communities that don't realize that filmmakers and artists are all around you. And I, I when I talk to uh, state legislatures and different uh, boards of Chamber of Commerce, I tell people when they walk into the room, I'm like, you know, uh, everybody here, you know, you have high property taxes and they're like, yes, high property taxes, it sucks, yes, cut the taxes. I'm like, well, listen, um, one of the things they always like to cut in property taxes is school taxes and what the schools get because a lot of people, yeah, they don't need, they only need schools for at most 18, uh, 15 years of their child's lives and then they're out on their own in college or whatever. But at the same, and then they're like, I don't have any more kids in the damn school system. Why should I pay into it? Right. And And here's the reason why, because- uh, pay, teaching kids all these great skills are necessary, but it also means teaching them the arts, mm-hmm. and you know, teaching them art, teaching them 
And then when I say arts, I even see industrial arts, like, you know, auto mechanics, yeah, wood shop, yeah, trades. trades. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's an art as well. But getting back to the, the arts. percent. Correct. So, so when you, when they start cutting things from the school budget, arts are one of the first things. You don't need to know how to color and stuff like that, or you don't need to do theater, or you don't need to be in a band, you know, that type of, of stuff. Of course you do. Right. And I say, but that there's a lot more higher skill set that goes into all those arts. And I tell people, I'm like, okay, you all walked in tonight, right? You went to your closet and you're like, I'm going to go to this school board meeting or I'm going to go to this budget meeting or whatever. And you put together your look. You have pants that went with that top with those shoes for the ladies, that purse or whatever you, and you put makeup on and all that stuff. That's taught in art class. That's Mm -hmm. color coordination. That is taught to you in art or it was taught to you by artists who did shows like Sesame Street, Electric Company, you know, the Great Space Coaster or whatever the kids have today, you know, Mm -hmm. with the Blues Clues and stuff like that. These are artists those artists learned art in school as well and these are things that are necessary every single day even in mental health i mean i don't know anybody that's had a math test save them from committing suicide right but a song like writing a song or painting or something has poetry pottery yeah all of that stuff it's an outlet and you turn on the radio you're listening Mm -hmm. to music music is an art form and that's taught you know and then and that's the type of things that you know so once again when i'm talking about how uh, i i'm kind of more about just being an artist. I'm about making sure art still st- sticks around and more art is uh, celebrated and, and, you know, independent film festivals, especially local film festival, mm-hmm. support these artists. If someone should come to you going, oh, so-and-so's grandson is making such and such and they're looking for fundraising or if they need help with something, do it. You'd be surprised that what little, what little you contribute in any situation, being volunteering your time, your skills, your space, or just suggesting someone else to, hey, go help them will uh, help a project come uh, a long way. I used to work on uh, Sons of Anarchy. I don't know if anybody ever heard that show. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't mean to say it like that guy where I'm like, oh, you I, did. <laughs> I was an avatar. I don't know if anyone's heard of that film. Um, I just saw Ron Perlman the other day, uh, last week. Oh, I love Ron. Um, you were golfing with him, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I golfed with him. <laughs> yeah, I went up to him. I said, thank you for your Twitter feed. I love you. <laughs> so good. And then he was like, I wish I didn't have to do it. <laughs> You meet his dog, Nigel? No, he didn't bring his dog. Um, But there was a guy, one of the producers on the show, he was the UPM, it was a guy named Kevin uh, Corcoran. And Kevin Corcoran was one of the original Mouseketeers. Wow. If you watch Swiss Swiss Family Robinson, he's the youngest kid. Wow. And uh, worked on the show for two years. It wasn't until like year season one and a half where I was like, you're moochie? (laughs) And because, but what we would do is, is, you know, after like five, six o'clock in in LA, everything pretty much shuts down. So if a production's running late on a Friday and I'm there till 1am, I got nothing to do for like the next seven hours. So him and I would just sit and talk. And one of the most amazing things he said to me was uh, armies travel on their stomach. And I said, well, what does that mean? He's like, if you feed them right and you treat them right, you don't have to pay them. Not that's, that you shouldn't, not that you, you should always pay them. That's my number one mm-hmm. suggestion. Yep. We, when we, we just had a, a reading of the Clerks 3 script uh, to fundraise for the theater that we auditioned at, the, the original Clerks. And uh, so there was another film crew there that's doing a documentary about Finding Kevin, it's called. And it's like advice about what other younger filmmakers, what kind of inspiration Kevin was to them and stuff like that. So they did this interview with me and uh, they were like, what's your most important advice to a filmmaker? And I said, no, you're going to want to punch in for this. I said, <laughs> catering. They were like, what? Catering. Craft services. Yep. Mm-hmm. Because you could have the crappiest of camera. You could have the crappiest of days, whatever. But if you're a crew working on this guy's project or this lady's project and you're doing 12, 13 hour days or something's gone wrong. And the one thing that your crew can depend on is at least they'll be fed well. Yeah. They'll stick it out with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's and true. I said, and it doesn't have to be one person. doesn't have to be one restaurant. doesn't have to be spread it out. The best way to do it is spread the damage about. So if one company or one person has to cook only once a week for an entire crew, it's not a big of a burden. Mm-hmm. But when you have one person cooking for five days in a row and they're, they're, they're running out and like, when am I getting paid for all this? You know, people will actually donate maybe one whole day sure. worth of mm-hmm. food. Especially if it's restaurants. I did a film up in Montrose where people made food for us every day. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's that's the best way to do it is find locals of the area that you're shooting in is, and you know, or parents of crew members who are really good cooks or what have you, because look, the pizza is good for when we've gone over and we didn't realize we were going to go over right. at the last minute or someone running and getting the dollar big max on a sale is, is another thing. But to do that every single day is just, it's not, it's, it's, it's kind of, yeah. dis, it's kind of disrespectful too in a way. Yeah. Well, you're eating shit. So everybody's going to feel Correct. like shit. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then I said, and just so you know, there's,
there's always one. They may not even say it, but there's at least one vegetarian or vegan on board. So just prepare for that as well. Mm-hmm. Think of them to, and do it without them even saying it because like, oh, uh, oh, this is vegan. Oh, this is awesome. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's we got not, the impossible burger from yes. right. Burger King. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Something. Yeah. So um, it's those type of things I think uh, make a production well, no matter how small or how large. Uh, craft services is always the hub uh, that keeps that the blood running in in a crew. Well, I mean, you've you've worked on you know many projects, theater, film, TV mm-hmm. since ninety three. Yes, did like when you look at how the production was handled on Clerks, and then you look at how either production has progressed. Like, what are the things that you've seen over time either change or stay the same? Well, I mean, the, up until t- even up until today, the obvious is the technology. Yeah, the, the technology leap is just incredible. I mean, there are films, the price, yeah, and the price to to make the films uh, and to make the projects. I mean, the amount of equipment we have just in this room alone was kind of more than what we even had for clerks in yeah. a way. You know, oh, I mean? thank you. And you have flat <laughs> panels and stuff like that. And you know, I mean, uh, thank you, China. No, I'm just, <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. It's like the cost of doing film now has dropped tremendously of the technology end of it. Now, still, you could have all the, the technology in the world, and if you have a shitty story, you're going to have a shitty story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so those are the things you just got to be like, all right, well, but in the meantime, there, I mean, there are film festivals that are all about making films with your phone, and that's it. You can It can only be made on a phone, and it's a really cool kind of parameter about a film festival. There are the 48 hour film festivals, 24 hour film festivals yep. where you I've walk a in of those, yeah. and you have a couple of people together and they go, all right, this is what we're doing. You guys got to make a movie in 24 hours and your subject is necrophilia. There we go. Run. <laughs> you know, it's that type of thing where you're like, what? And like, all right, we're going to do it. And whatever I don't know it is, anything it is. about night touching. <laughs> <laughs> so all the breeze. Right. It's so, pretty remarkable though, how quickly technology jumped because 93 black and white 16 millimeter they did clerks yeah and he was buying he was buying short ends wasn't right. he it was yeah. like all the leftover stocks that nobody else i mean used. he had full he had full reels but towards the end it was like well we don't need that much yeah. i mean i mean if you went longer than two takes there was sweat building on kevin's brow like oh, come on i mean is don't that how many takes it was one or two yeah most at most three there was one night how many it, rehearsals it, it, before the take though a month we had a month of rehearsals. So even on the day, would you rehearse or no? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We would rehearse once just to, well, also you want to get framing and camera angles. Right. So we would rehearse while they were getting their yeah, camera. Theater, theater it's theater not like we had brilliant. stand-ins to come over <laughs> and sit in and to, to do lighting and framing. We did our own. Um, plus, you know, th- we had like two units, three units of lights, I think, um, because we did utilize the actual fluorescence in the building. You can't shoot on color film with fluorescence. It's There's a, it, Everybody looks like you're in the Matrix, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um it's that type of thing. That's kind of why we went black and white. And then the fact that Kevin geniusly wrote gums being jammed into the uh, locks of the shutters so that we could film with the shutters closed at night, but All people day. would never yep. know. Yep. And uh, so there you go. But so 93, 16 millimeter black and white, eight years later, this technology of high def was just starting to yeah, I think it was Become, the Viper cam, I think, that, or the Genesis camera that came out at like that, that time. Yeah. And we, Brian and I, starred in an independent film in Toronto in, it was June, July, August, that, that whole summer. Right. We did a full-length feature romantic comedy on high def, and it was unbeknownst to us at the time, or maybe we did know. No, we did know. It, it, was, the, it was the first full-length was, feature film done on high def in Canada. In Canada. It was really? The, that's yeah. how new the technology was. Wow. George Lucas had just gotten done shooting episode- Attack of the Clones. Uh, uh, no, episode one, actually. He did a couple shots digital there, didn't he? He, he did. Was, okay. Yeah. And so he had shot episode one, and um, then we, then the, the same technology was then brought to this editing house in Toronto, and as like a huge boon to the production, they were like, we need something that's shooting now because we want to be able to edit this stuff and be able to then sell to our clients here in Canada that we have the experience to edit in 24p and blah, 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 you know, right. digital. And so it was uh, really cool having this technology. Now, there in the beginning, uh, you know, the makeup artists especially had to adjust. I remember that. Really, because some people would look like, you know, really heavy makeup when yeah. you would normally would be good for film film, but not digitally because digital high def was as it was high def. When so, I was in film school, one of the makeup classes all, we had was HD yeah, makeup. Yeah, it's very yeah. different. It's almost very naturalistic, just what you're wearing kind of thing. And for men, it's just the base, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, throw but, the powder on. That's yeah, it. That was We're pretty good. much it. Mm-hmm. So that's another leap in the technology. It's, you know, the technology then changes everything else. And that was just in eight years. Right. 
Oh, I know. I know. That's why it's so incredible. But mm-hmm. when you, but when you look at that, when you look at like my, 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 one of my film buddies always had this saying, like, just because you have, just because you have a hammer doesn't know you how to make, doesn't mean you know how to build a house. Yeah. True. Right. So the gear, like I see all these people who are like getting all this gear and all this stuff. Right. Cause it's like, so yeah, cheap. The gear is great. But can you tell the story? Right. Like, mm-hmm. what does this mean? Why is, why is the shot of the cook in Red October there? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. And nobody, I don't see a lot of, there's very few like newer, like young filmmakers that, that was such really a do that. Really obscure reference about the cook in Red October. It's my favorite. I know reference. it is. I, yeah. he, he used, he used it like a month ago. Cause yeah, yeah. it was, it was a good one. Well, what, 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 what makes it such a great reference for you? Be, be, because, uh, who is it? Spoiler uh, alert. Uh, uh, it's, it's right at, it's right after they it's exchange foreshadow- the keys. It's obviously foreshadowing that he's yeah, the guy. Tim Curry and, and Tim, uh, Sean Connery takes the keys, tells, uh, Sam, uh, What's his name? Sam, Rip. Jurassic Park. Uh, um, Sam Neill. Yeah, I'm taking the keys. He witnessed it, and then they walk away, and then it just slowly just goes up to the cook for like six seconds, mm. and then it just cuts away back to Alec Baldwin. Mm. So it's just it's it's one of those things where it's just it's blatant, right? You know what I mean? So in, right. like, if he was just in the background, and just did a look like that, like that would have worked less than like once you see the cook, you're like, oh, I knew it all right. along, and I didn't realize I knew it. And mm. then when you rewatch it, you're like, it's the fucking cook. <laughs> Like, you know, right there, it's the fucking cook. Right. One of my um, favorite movies, by the way. On for Red October? Yeah, absolutely. Did, I, did you, I, did they, did they just do a 4K? Cause I think I was watching the 4K. I'll watch it. If there's nothing on, I'll watch Red Rock, Red October. That's one of my favorite films. And the Abyss. Mm-hmm. I like, Shawshank I, I, see is mine. Now, see, I like the original ending, the Abyss. No, yeah. why? Yeah. Do you see the director's cut? That's what I mean, the director's cut. Oh, yeah. Meaning so the original what he oh, wanted. Yeah, not, yeah. not what they put out. The original. Oh, it's so directed. much better. Yeah, it is. So much yeah. better. And then the documentary, uh, was it, what is he called? Uh, 100 Miles of Bad Road. Right. I wanted to go down <laughs> there to life. Gaffney, South Carolina and see where they shot. It's still there. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. It's still there. Uh, did you ever see the director's cut of Aliens? Yes. Of those fucking machine guns. Just mm-hmm. like, and just like, why wasn't this in the movie? I know. <laughs> It's so awesome. Um, it's your boom and cool. You got your boom So what, cool. I mean, like that had, a, I mean, so interestingly enough, and I don't think people can understand this, is like you probably, you guys all get recognized everywhere you go, probably. And one, I mean, you were up at the Vo- Volca Airport. So right, I yeah. mean, what it, so that was a change back in 93, 94, and it just kept growing and growing and growing. I mean, is that, is that really weird or is that, is it, you know, are you grateful? Is it liberating? Is well, it? Yeah, listen, I, I'm really grateful for what the film has done recognition wise. It helps uh, when I'm, a, you know, being introduced or auditioning for other other work. There's a, uh, there's some work that the, someone can look at and say, hey, well, yes, I loved you in Clerks and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it's it's never a good time like when you're looking for a bank loan. <laughs> You know, or when you're being pulled over by cops and you're like, you know, you're talking to the person like, yeah, you know, I, I really would love to get this over with because you know, I'm not even supposed to be here at this part of the street today. Get it? Not, get nothing. It. Okay. Just like that blank stare from yeah. the cop. Okay. Uh, yes, I will appear. Yeah. In Registration too. Yeah. All right. <laughs> You know, but when it is, it's it's kind of fun. It's you know uh, the fan base for Kevin's uh, work has always been great. Uh, yeah. it, you know we're regular people, um, and they're all like, "I can't believe you're even here!" Oh my God! I mean, and people say like, "Do you get sick of when people say, hey, are you even supposed to be here today?'" <laughs> and oh. I'm just like, you know what? I, I I'm fine with it. I have no problems with it at all. I mean, it could be worse. I mean, Marilyn Gigliotti, my co-star in the movie. I mean, that poor in a girl, row. I yeah, love that, her. That, yeah, that poor girl gets screamed. Try not to suck any dick on the way to the parking lot. <laughs> and she's so sweet. Yeah, exactly. I know, I love and here's her. the thing: so like, sweet. here it is. If you're seeing a woman on the street and some bearded, usually bearded dude, is screaming that at some <laughs> woman, and you have no idea what the reference is, you'd be like, "What? You go and apologize to that young woman. How dare you, young man?" That is so rude. <laughs> and then you look at her and you go, 37? Right. 37? So In a row? I look, <laughs> we have catchphrases uh, that people love to, look, to scream at us and stuff like in, that. In regards to the sucking 37 dicks, I yeah. mean, that whole storyline as to where that even comes from. When Brian told you about that video convention in, yeah, the, yeah. in the Catskills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We had a, a gala dinner. A gala dinner. People are in gowns, okay? Like tuxes like, and yeah. shit. Yeah. And the women, are, you know, are all with the diamonds and stuff. And they're like either the wives of the CEOs. Some lady 
all refined looking, hair up and everything. She came up to me completely. Three sheets to the wind. Yeah, she was totally hammered. <laughs> and she she gets right in my face. Well, in Brian's, between the two of us. And she's like, so how many dicks has she sucked? <laughs> oh my God. I was like, See, you know what the thing about hoity-toity people is? <laughs> At the end of the day, they can still act oh, like Oh, they all oh want to suck dick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know it. They all want to. They're you know closet what? alcoholics. Mm. Hate their life. No, no, I've, hang, I've hung out with bank presidents, and when they feel, it's like when it's like when they feel it, they feel comfortable that they can say fuck around you. It's almost like this weight's lifted off yeah, your shoulders. Yeah, I do right, feel that. Right. Yeah. You're like, wait, I can talk like a normal person mm. around you? I'm like, yeah, hey, you, you weren't always a bank president. <laughs> like, you know, let's just talk. Yeah. Mm. Um, what, what's, 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 like, where do you guys find your passion? Where do you guys find, you know, the thing that like drives you every day? Cause I, I, I'm getting pretty cynical lately and she'll attest to that where I'm like, it all just fucking, I'm like that. Remember that season of South park where it just ended with everything sucks. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm at like, I'm at like season 14 episode 12 and I'm, and I'm trying to, to get back to zero just to find a place that I feel like I can do something meaningful. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I have a very good. And then I cry to myself to sleep at I night. I have a very good circle of friends, yeah. uh, creative types that I hang out with at least once a month down in uh, central Jersey where, where I grew most up from. Is that your, like your therapy? Uh, kind of. Yeah. Hey, oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. And we give it to each other. We fucking rip into each other like nobody's business. So um, <laughs> yeah. And what we do is we play poker. Gotcha. And you guys, guys are all about poker. Guys, Ernie's all about poker. Guys, oh, yeah, they're yeah, all. Guys and girls both. Um, Love it. Like, great players, but also we're really good. And we're always, like, we have writers involved in this. We have producers. We have directors. We have other, all of us are pretty much actors for the most part. Um, is, it, is it like the poker games that would happen at the tow shop? Like, the, the tow truck, truck shop? Like we're in the back of the garage no, after five. It, you know yeah. what I mean? It's like no, it's like no, no, no. no. Robbie, you go house. fuck yourself too, because no. yeah, oh, no, you know, no, yeah. no, no. It's not. It's not like but it's uh, all friendly ribbon. It is fully yeah. all friendly ribbon. It's usually like, hey, we're gonna get together. Uh, we're gonna have some dinner. Either we'll bring it in from somewhere, or we'll go somewhere and have dinner, and then come back to the house, and then we'll get together and play poker. Started friendly, and then as it evolved uh, over about a year, because we started in two thousand and four, and then it is this grew. Shit still going. No. Yeah, not as well, much as it used to. Much. Like oh, usually it's now, it's usually it's around awesome. certain yeah. ho- certain yeah. holidays. But yeah. it, when we first started doing it, the the whole reason why we started doing it was because whenever we saw these actor friends that we had known for years, it was only ever at a production of a show that they were doing. Right. So that was the only time we ever saw each other. Where we'd go see them and say, you were great. Then go to have drinks and whatever dinner and that was afterwards. It. And then and we would never see like, them. Oh, I want to see them. And the, the only time you'll see them again is with we're working together. Right. If that right. Days. So, so we want to just have that interaction some more. Yeah. So we did this little small gathering. We we're like, you know, we should all get together just like to hang out that has nothing to do with acting. And that's what we started doing at the beginning of 2004. And it was really fun and it got competitive pretty quick, but in a friendly way. And then, maybe one set of friends told some other friends and they brought in more people and it started to grow. And by 2006, two years later, it got hardcore competitive. Yeah. We had like like the international poker tournament. Yeah, pretty much. We had points. We had points before they had points, like a point system, like if you finish in a certain area, it's like that. Money wise, it was still all low waging. We're not spending, we're not doing, we're not not doing, yeah, we're not doing like Affleck kind of betting and stuff like that. No, No, the money wasn't the issue. issue. It was just, it was just the skill of being able to to play poker and And, read people and stuff like that. And then when new people would be like friends would bring in some newcomers um, who, you know, were noobs. And they're taking a little longer maybe to decide on how they're going to bet on their hand. Uh, some of the hardcore people, you know, someone would scream out, clock, meaning, you know, <laughs> you know, pick it up, pick up the pace. And it started getting rude. People started behaving right. badly. So, yeah, it started to get a little ugly. And then says the person who took up a lot of clock. <laughs> Sounds like that to me. I, know, I just don't. No. <laughs> so, uh, so from no. there, uh, so three sevens still, is good, right? Yeah, exactly. We get, we get, we still get together and stuff like that. Like just recently I hosted a 4th of July party on July 6th, the Saturday. And we had about 30 people come up to the house from central Jersey, do the two hour drive. And we did, we had, um, uh, 18 people play the poker game. And so that, and that went on until like two. And was that cash? 
Uh, Did no, you do cash? No, that was just straight up just oh, points. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's everybody's looking forward. To. Like, is some is everybody is, chomping at the bit for like when's the next one? Uh, yes and no, but I mean, a lot of them now have kids that are now going to school and stuff. And some of the players, their kids are already gone through college and they're done. So now they are the ones who are like, yeah, let's play some more. Yeah. Um. So the next game is like uh, uh September seventh or something like that. Yep. September. Yeah. Yes. But that's down in Jersey, so everybody, so how, but how, everybody gets a chance to host. How important is that to 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 keep doing that shit? Oh, it's necessity. I mean, because we we say it all the time, like, oh, we should do this more often again. But once again, it's just life. Yeah. Life has us taking in us into different directions. Like uh, my one friend's wife. Uh, husband uh he's traveling to london and dubai all the time because he does a lot of banking issues and stuff like that uh my other friends they, they own a, a doggy daycare business in jersey city so she's always there taking care of that now um and that's the type of things like we don't every once in a while we're, we're talking about doing a play again together because that's what we mostly do is theater together and we'll hold it at either new jersey repertory theater or we'll hold it at uh our friend teaches at a catholic school so we'll take their space in the summer to do professional theater mixed in with students as well. So it's almost like a work, you know, work program for the students and stuff like that. Yeah, but it's and not it's, selfish. You give them it's back. It's not, no. Right. And, yeah. and we don't we don't get paid for any of it, actually. Um, but it's just the love of doing it yeah. and wanting to do it. And so those are the kind of things, getting back to your original question about passion, um, that drives us. Now, I'm fortunate enough that I can do these comic cons to be on the road a lot to meet with fans and to meet with other artists as well and then talk and film festivals and go to film festivals as well to meet other filmmakers and other artists and other directors and other producers to work on things um does that ever end up panning out yeah no they do i mean i I work those who like don't go i i want to film festival look for people who want to get into the film industry go to film festivals even if you don't have a film go to them you know make sure you you have yourself some sort of you know pack of uh, business cards you know they have those you know 500 for 10 bucks on you know vista, <laughs> vista print or whatever print, yep. yeah and just have you, you know glossy right mm-hmm. and put your photo on it so people remember because a lot of times people can't just remember names but it's always great i say to put your face on it almost like a realtor does on right. their business card put your face on it your phone number or whatever phone number you want them to contact if you have your own website have it on there and uh have your you know email address and whatever so that people can contact you and and say what it is that you do like actor producer or writer or actor voiceover you know voiceover singer whatever it is that you do put that on the title of your card and then hand them out when you get to a film you know when you go to these film festivals there's usually a Q&A right after it with the filmmaker or producer or maybe one of the stars afterwards and whatever part of that industry you want to do go up and give them your honest opinion man I thought that was great or how how you were able to get the use of a tank for your film must have been incredible how that happened. You know, whatever it is. George Lucas. Yeah, if you ever get involved in it, you can then say, hey, man, I'm a local whatever, or I work out of these such and such, or I will travel for whatever, but I've worked on this. If you check my IMDb or whatever, you know, and have that conversation. It's a good way to get that networking start. I mean, Stacey, you can speak more to this than me even about how, you know, getting around to different industries and, and making oh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, I mean, you, sure. you were kind of crushing that. And you still do. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I mean, I mean, you've only told me like these, these, you're like, I used to go to conventions. <clears throat> yeah, like, but you do. Like, you meet everyone. And I'm like, everyone. oh, you went to fucking thousands of them. No, I haven't been to thousands. Brian's probably been, uh, I've been to been quite to a thousands. few. Uh, but I mean, I, but, it, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a good way, especially with, and in comic cons is another thing. I mean, it's not, I don't get work from comic cons, but I do get to meet some of the artists that I might be working with in the future. Um, like just recently I was just at a comic con Roy, uh, Rob Schneider was at, and I have a producer friend down, down, yeah, mm-hmm. down in Tennessee. Who's like going to be working on his next project and he wants me to be a part of it. Now I didn't go over to Rob like, we might be working soon. Yeah. Cause I don't, that's not, that's not how that works, but it's kind of thing where you're like, Hey man, uh, it's nice to know that you get to work with people again and again. And just recently Jason Muse has his new film out called madness. And I Method. saw the trailer for that. Mm-hmm. That's out now. It got released on August 2nd, and you can watch it on iTunes and on Amazon, plus a bunch of theaters that'll be coming soon. Um, And so a lot of the casting that he did was through the relationships he developed while on the Comic-Con circuit. And uh, so you'll see a lot of people like, you know, Dean Kane or Terry Hatcher and... um, (laughs) Yeah, Terry Hatcher seems to have a big role in that. Yeah, Danny Trejo's in it. I love him. Uh, Um... Vinnie Jones, the British actor, is in it. And myself, it's literally the last cameo of Stan Lee shows up in this That's film. Right, yeah. Um, so it's it's kind of funny and it's like kind of like an alternate universe of Hollywood and an alternate universe Jay Muse and all of us are in this kind of alternate universe of what Jay 
perceives Hollywood to be and how he would wish it could be kind of thing. It's very funny. It's a really cool meta kind of universe uh, suspense thriller comedy is the only way I can put it. So if you get a chance, please put go, every uh, genre. Yeah, in it is. <laughs> it is. It's kind of it's kind of funny and people will understand it once they see it. So if you see Madness and the Method, go to um, Apple TV or iTunes or Amazon. I believe it's also streaming on the Xbox and PlayStation Network. Have, have you have either one of you ever gone to like one of these conventions or festivals and met somebody where you're like, I, there's something special about that person and I have to figure out a way to work with them? Oh, um, you know, I mean, without naming names, it might yeah, not even no, there, come to fruition. Th- there are, there are tons of, of people who uh, I've seen at these conventions or even film festivals. Like I would love to work. With well, them. his, one of his, I, I think, I, it, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, one of his top five people that he's dying to work with, Ricky Gervais. Oh, Ricky Gervais. Yeah, I mean, I have never met him. Fucking dude's yeah, brilliant. Yeah, but you guys right. look like you could be like cousins. Well, yeah, brothers. that's I yeah, brothers. American yeah, cousins. That's what I mean. Like, that's, that's, that's I would love. See to, if you could bring the uh, office. <laughs> correct. I would. Do you watch definitely. Afterlife? Oh yeah, yeah. What do you no, think no, about no, no, it? No, 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 oh no, no, not Afterlife. No, I'm that's sorry. his new one. Uh, his new one. What what network is it on? Netflix. That's Netflix. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't we don't have Netflix. Yeah. I know we're gonna sound like really old. <laughs> We don't have Netflix. Do you still have the fucking Sundance channel? I'll give you my password. You can watch it. You know what it is? He travels so much and he's home so little that when he's home, we don't think like, oh, maybe we should get Netflix and watch such and such because we still have dozens of free films that we get from the Screen Actors Guild for the award, you know, we have to watch for the awards. That we still haven't watched because he's never home. Well, long enough. Hold on, hold on. Uh, slow your roll now because many times <laughs> I'm just like, hey, we should watch this. I'm like, I'm not in the mood for that movie. So don't be like, we don't watch it because. Oh, you're like my I wife. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But she's like, I'm not in the mood for that movie. I bought Aquaman in 4K because she goes, I want to watch that tonight. Sucker. It took us eight weeks. Wow. And then I watched it and I'm like, I paid for that. Yeah. <laughs> you did. I paid for that. I watched that on a flight to London. That was it. And you're just like, so it wasn't oh, good. Just go down. No, it was a good, it was all right. It was uh, okay. Special effects should have definitely won the award it there. It, but it, it was definitely the guys from funny enough. The, the guys from the abyss going, finally, we can use your luminescence again. <laughs> So the guys quick. who perfected the luminescent freaking special effects. It looked finally, great. It looked awesome. It looked phenomenal. And it totally was like, I totally could see a mashup between the, the aliens from the abyss coming up right now. Yeah, this should waiting, be it. I was waiting for the NTIs to show. Right, exactly. Right. You're really getting into this. So is Afterlife, has it gone beyond one season? So uh, Ricky, Gervais, it- Ricky Gervais just posted, I think, yesterday the day before he has the script for season two. Okay, Perfect. so the um, full season but, has... Yes, yeah, so yes. season one's out there. But to go back to like... Um, Working with like, He's idols. dark. I love it. Right. Yeah. And you know how, like I was saying, like I'm really, I'm being really cynical lately. Mm -hmm. It seems like Ricky J's, Ricky Gervais was going through his cynical period Mm. and somehow tried to make it funny. Well, listen, we just. It works perfectly. We just got done reading what was going to be the Clerks 3 script just the other day, which was an extremely dark. Well, I'd like to talk about that if possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. It was just an extremely dark script um, that he was in a period of his life that was very dark. And so, um, you know, as he said, even at the Q and A of the after the reading, like you know, he thought what you know pain and suffering was, and then he had a heart attack, and he was like, "Whoa, well, this is what real loss could be, and real pain and suffering." And so, um, in a way, I'm I'm glad we're not we're not producing that script. Um, there's a lot of a lot of changes for a lot of the characters in their lives during that script, and uh, Kevin just talked about it a post. Uh, yesterday, either late last night or early today, that uh, he wants to maybe do more of this script reading once again to still raise money for the First Avenue Playhouse in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. Um, so if we were to do some more, I, w- I would love to be a part of it again because it is a, uh, a really different aspect of what the characters of that viewers universe would be going through in this time period. Does anybody have to take a pee? No, I'm good for now. Do you mind if I run real quick? Yeah, by all means. <laughs> all right, because I Stacy, you have the ball. I have Stacey, the ball. I have the bladder yeah. of a small chick f- fly. <laughs> Hold me close, a tiny yeah. bladder. Uh, I had to pee again today. <laughs> it's like I'd ask you because I, I mean, Marilyn kind of told me on the car ride home on Monday or to the airport on Monday um, about what the script was that you read. Um, but I know the second I start asking you about it, you're going to have to go through it again. I don't know. Mm. The, I don't know if we're allowed to talk we about can't it. Talk only, 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 only because okay. only because he's looking to raise more money with it gotcha. uh, for the First Avenue Playhouse. But um, n- needless to say, there's um, 
if where we last left off with clerks to uh, the characters of Dante and Becky, Becky's pregnant with uh, Dante's uh, hideous love child. Um, and then <laughs> she that, actually isn't hideous. Right. And the, uh, and then the store has been bought back by the guys from, uh, you know, Dante and Randall. So, and then Elias obviously was part of part of it as well. But, um, you know, some of the aspects, what's, what's funny is like <coughs> kind of Kevin's strip mind when we were definitely, this was a no go. We were never going to make that clerks three when, um, Jeff Anderson just pulled out of, uh, negotiations kind of like a month before we were ready to film. Um, Kevin went really dark and didn't know what to do. And, uh, so then he went on to do yoga hosers and, uh, and so then the next script that, uh, we were, he wanted to work on was a Jay and Silent Bob script because he owns those characters. He doesn't have to deal with anybody with licensing and stuff like that. So, um, he went on to do Jay and Silent Bob's, uh, reboot, which is coming out, uh, this October. Um, so if people, people who have been part of this reading that we did will eventually see the Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Kevin went to that gold mine of very funny stuff that does work in this Clerks 3 script, pulled it out and used many pieces of it in the Jay and Silent Bob reboot. So especially the 100 or 200 people who were at the reading this past weekend who heard the full script, when they go to see the Jay and Silent Bob movie, um, they'll see like, oh, wow, this is, I can see where he pulled that from, from the Clerks script. Like literally the, uh, the trailer, so I'm not speaking out of turn here, the trailer of Jay and Silent Bob reboot where the SWAT team comes to take out Jay and Silent Bob from, <coughs> from their dispenser. Donnell Rawlings is there. Yeah. Correct. Donnell, yeah. hilarious guy. Uh, that whole scene was literally the big opening <laughs> scene of the original Clerks 3 as well. So um, we've added more to it for the, the Jay and Bob reboot. But in the end, um, it's pretty much the same. I'm blocking the camera. I know. <laughs> it's just a little bit. Whenever we're driving, I'm always like, hey, London Fog, yes. do you mind? I feel like I'm, I'm driving. this concert. I know. Um, or sometimes I'll go, hey, Snoop Dogg, could you, could you settle down? I'm trying to drive yeah. here. Stick to gin and juice. What are you doing? Yeah. Um, have you, have you, I mean, have you found that like, you know, as creatives that like your, how important is it to have life experiences that you can bring to roles or performances, especially because I don't think here's, here's what I think. And there's a local theater community around here and everybody's incredibly talented. And you know, that remember the Sunday Anarchy guy I was telling you about Kevin Corcoran. He's like, actors want to act, man. Like yeah. they just, they don't care what it is. I mean, obviously it can't be, you know, something that they're not going to connect with, but they want to act. Yeah. And if they're, and if they're going to take a pay cut or they're not going to get paid as long as they believe in it, like they're going to be there. There's thousands, that's the beauty about passion. there's thousands. And that's not just <coughs> actors. That's band members. That's oh, absolutely. musicians. Hey, uh, this restaurant up here wants three hours of something. They could pay us dinner. That's it. Yeah. You know, you're well, gonna, I played for beer, man. Yeah. You're going to yeah. load in your drum kit and four <laughs> things and this, that, and three amps and the mixing board. And God yep. forbid you're got a brass section as well, you know, and you're going to fit in this tiny closet of a space, yeah. but you know, play for us. Um, and that's artists in general. And, uh, where, you know, it's not many other trades that go, I'll do that for free. You know what I mean? Like, they're like, Hey man, if you want me to build that house, you're going to have to buy wood and then the wood's not going to be donated for free. You know? It's that type of thing where passion kicks in. And um, it also is like the gym to keep yourself limber. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're always, acting, you're always, ex you're always exercising. Acting is always great to, uh, to do in, in any sorts of ways, especially if you're doing character work. And uh, it expands your different range of different characters you want to do. And uh, they, these are the type of things that is good to see. And sometimes as an audience member, you got to know that that's what it is. Like stage readings, for instance. Stage readings are just, you, it's usually actors with music stands in front of them with the script or they're standing with the script or they're all sitting at a table in front of an audience. And that's to workshop the storyline yeah. for the writer. Mm -hmm. The writer just wants to hear the words and hear what the audience will laugh at or don't laugh at if it's not a comedy or cry at or what have you. And uh, even those things are incredibly fun to work as right. an artist on because you're, you you're have, workshopping, you're it. workshopping yeah. it. And then they'll take your opinion as well most of the time. We did a workshop session here a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, we did. A couple months ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll carry have you, have you found, cause I find this too, cause it, and, it, and it really bothers me, um, in, in this, whatever fucking sect of this business I'm in is that a lot of the times I see, you know, you just keep saying this, that you, we're going to be charging you 200 an hour for this kind of therapy session. Do you want to be on the couch? 
I was look. I was in, so far. You've said four questions like, and I really hate this, but. <laughs> And I'm just like, I don't know. I'm so glad you're doing I was the this. Because normally I tear him apart no, I was afterwards. Fucking, no, not, all, right, all right, let's go. Let's hey, go. Hey, hey, hold on. A, I'm not tearing him apart. I'm making an observation. Correct, you're right. B, he hasn't gone full like crying and he's not drinking the gin and juice yet. Yeah, he's yeah. been so, sober. Yeah. And, it, and, and C, if, well, that glaucoma if, if, if this is helping him and maybe someone else out there and you're listening and reviewing audience, that's good. I'm just saying... It's kind of funny that, and I hate this, but, and then we go into it. But go well, I'm just, I'm, so my, I was the fat kid. I grew up fat. We, I was the fat kid too. I'm still the fat kid. Well, I, my whole thing was always steal their thunder. Okay. So I'm going to make fun of myself before you can Correct. make fun That's of the, me. I was, yeah. I, I call that the best defensive uh, yeah. defense as an, a defensive lawyer. Um, yes, your honor. He was caught with knives, but do you know where those knives came from? <laughs> they came from his grandfather who was a world war two vet who stormed the beaches of Iwo Jima. And what I got to say is when he looked at that knife and he saw that this was something to defend America, he thought at that moment when he had to plunge that knife into that victim's heart, he thought that that person was storming his house. House, which was a beach. <laughs> he's dangerous because he's so good on his feet. Like he could have been a lawyer, literally. <laughs> yeah. All right. My insecurities aside. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, like, look, we're we're. I left LA in two thousand, late two thousand nine, because I was like, man, I, I just feel like a needle in a stack of needles. Um, and I just, I just, I don't feel like I can do anything because if I'm good at craft service, they're gonna keep me here. I'm not gonna. There's no upward growth. So I moved, got sober, and then. You know, a lot of the same things that I saw in L.A. were happening in in our business where it's like, you know, the, just the nobody trusting anybody and the ignorance and nobody wants to pay for anything. And it really started to bother me about like the. Well, the nobody's started. Nobody wanted to pay for anything was because of the technology costs had gone down and more and more people wanting to do this because technology has gotten we, so cheaper. They think they can do it. So we, and they're doing a lot more non-union stuff. Right. Right. Which the, union, get, the unions they can lost get away. their power. Yeah. The, the writer strike really effed us. I was there for that. So that once, terrible. once the reality TV producers came in like, I can give you entertainment without paying a nickel. All yep. we do is load that house up full of liquor, tell them we're going to make them all famous, and they'll sit in that house for as long as they want and try to make themselves famous yep. for as long as they want. And that's what it was. And, and then we can the, tell them what to do. Right, exactly. And we can, you know, uh, script it somewhat. It's like scripted television. I'm like, well, isn't that what we were doing? And it's called stories and with actors and actual yeah, plots. And a lot but of these right. commercials are all buyouts now because are non-union yeah. gigs. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the thing. Like we would love, you know, like I come from the construction business. My family had a construction business, right? And they had non-union work and union work because, you know, you got to stay alive and there were some things that it was good for and there's some things it's bad for, right? There's some non-union shit that's, that Correct. is bad. Um, and I always looked at it that way where I'm like, you know, if we don't, mm -hmm. you know, we're not, we might not get the best people, you know, but at least we're saving money and we're going to get the job done. But I found that like, you know, even in Hollywood and in and, and here and television or, or wherever, it seems like, you know, a lot of the times people take advantage of the fact that like what we were talking about before where, you know, actors, artists want to want to art. That's what they want to do. Like they're, yeah. they're dying to do it. And there's people who will be like, well, how bad do you want to do it? And right. I'm not talking about in a creepy way. I'm talking about like, well, you do it for nothing. Right. Yeah, I'll See, do it yeah. for nothing. And they're like, we don't have to pay for that shit. And here's and here's just a small little flip political side thing here. Yeah. Just and then we'll go back to the main conversation. Yeah. And this is where universal healthcare helps, because now as an actor, if I'm not making the money that I that, but at least I know I can still. Don't worry if I get sick right. and have healthcare, yeah. then I don't have to worry about. It. I can do the free stuff. I can do the all right. I'm not going to be on the union. You know, and the reason a lot of people are doing unions is because they don't want to get hurt and they want to have health coverage right. to get it done. But at the same time, it's like that's where a universal health care, you as the producers not having to pay into that union health care mm -hmm. and, and also then just businesses not having to buy, you know pay for the health care. Well, it's area. terrible because it makes it's it huge. awful for us not to hire people. I yeah. know, we hate it. We've looked into it a, a bunch of times, yeah, but we, it's just, I mean, even Stacey's for commercials. Been on the phone with yeah. for hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's tough. It, it really is tough. And, um, you know, this is where I, uh, the healthcare argument in, in, the, in the general politics of things is bigger than what people realize. And it's not just like, you want to give these Mexicans our free healthcare. No. How dare you? It's like, no, it's not at all. It's, it's not uh, at all. small business doesn't have to spend half their profits by paying for their seven employees' healthcare because they're good people. They want to give their employees healthcare, but it's taking a ton of money. You want to hear something yeah. fucking crazy? Mm -hmm. We were looking for... Um, like business grants or stuff. Cause we, you know, 
what do we want to do? We want to increase the tax base. Of course. The more money we get in here, the more mm-hmm. taxes we pay, everybody's yeah. happier. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So we were looking into like small business grants or things from the state that would help mm-hmm. out. One of the first things is like, unless you have $800,000 in equipment, mm-hmm. which is what you needed in 1984 to do what we did. Correct. They yeah. won't give you a nickel. Yeah, that's for the so like all the, all the, the money film tax goes credits, to like QVC, all of it. Um, M. Night Shyamalan, and oh, like that's Pittsburgh. about it. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. Pittsburgh. 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 Mm-hmm. Like they need it. Well, that's what I'm saying. No, they do. Yeah. No, hold on. They no, do. They, they, they no, do no, it throw, no throwing shade to other productions. Well, they do it, need it. Uh, QVC? Yeah, they do. Seriously? Yeah, they do. <laughs> I, know I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they'd operated a profit without the state's help. But what do I know? Correct. Um, you know, the the tax incentives is, are supposed to entice productions. No, to come of here. course. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the but they did just change the rules, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. And um, they upped the budget too. Which they was upped good. your tax uh, benefits tremendously. <clears throat> the state of Pennsylvania. Did. Correct. And then oh. I just found out that Southern New Jersey. What was it? The guy, oh yeah, it's up too because we were on the phone with the guy from the, the guy who the, runs it. He runs the film office and yeah. he said that they in jersey, it, in Lo- jersey. south jersey okay. now south jersey when you get to like the pine barrens atlantic gotcha. city areas you get an additional five percent and then if you hire someone who has um like a different ethnicity um you get another two percent making it a total of 37 percent 37 37 in a row yep. in a row <laughs> <laughs> oh that's a callback <laughs> You should use that for commercials for the, for the state. Crazy. Thirty-seven in a row. <laughs> what's what either, for either one of you? What's what's a role um, that you really are like? That was I really not a not a not a career defining role or anything like that. It doesn't have to be. But what, is there a role that's that's like this? I really really like that character. Besides the commercial you're in for. I know what you're going to say. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, he knows what I'm going to say. What are you going to say? So I've done a lot of theater and I've done a a lot of really great shows. Yeah. But in uh, 1997, uh, an off-Broadway play, the script became available to community theater. Yeah. The rights. Yeah. And um, it was all a buzz at the theater that I was doing a lot of shows at. And they were like, oh, you'd be great you'd be great, you'd be great. And I'm like, oh, what's the storyline? They're like, oh, it's a story about this guy, this middle-aged man who's having a midlife crisis and he he finds a stray dog in the park and the actress plays the dog and uh, Sarah. Je- and then I come to find out that Sarah Jessica Parker had originated this role off Broadway. She wasn't the dog, right? She was. Oh. Yeah. And the, Why uh, the long face? And and, and then <laughs> and the thing is, is it's not played where the the actress is in a costume, because this is all through the eyes of a dog owner, and every dog owner sees their dog as human, yeah, pretty much, yeah, absolutely, and what they're thinking, and you know when they're barking, what they think they're saying, and stuff. What's, what's the name of the play? And the play is called Sylvia by A R Gurney. There you go. And so anyway, I Gurney. A. A. R. Gurney. Gurney. Yeah. He's done a bunch of plays. I feel, yeah. ignorant. I feel ignorant and stupid. No, don't, don't. I mean, okay. this is theater stuff. So, okay. you know. Theater gives me terrible anxiety being Why? in the audience. Why? It's like that episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm where Larry forgets the line. Oh, you're worried about the actor forgetting I'm a line? fucking terrified. I went and saw Once Upon a Time at the Forum or whatever with Nathan Lane. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I was terrified the entire You're time. You're terrified for the audience? I mean, uh, for no, the No, no, no. I'm terrified for the performers. I can give a shit about the oh audience. Oh, my gosh. I am terrified Isn't for the weird, performers. Isn't it weird? Like, that is so... I could see... I won't go to Look, theater. I could see you feeling that way if you went to like a local production and your friend was in it. Don't care. And you're worried for your friend. <laughs> I am terrified. I saw I saw Paul McCartney forget his lyrics to one of his his best songs that everyone knows. Yeah, so, but he, I mean, but they but they pick up. Meaning, like when they fumble, they know how to just go right back into I it. I know you're seeing a shooting star, and it, to some, it might be beautiful, but my heart just goes. <laughs> oh. oh, it's bad. That's the producer in you. Oh, yeah, it's bad. It, it really is. And I'm like, oh no, I. But that's I feel it for the talent. I don't feel it for the audience. Oh, I'm so like no, I go in there, and I'm I'm just ready to be wow. So here's how I overcame all that. My wedding, I said, they were like, you know, everybody's pissed off because it's not, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't plan. Um, I'm not like, they're like, is, I'm like, is did we get a cake? Um, <laughs> you so, just showed up. So like two days before, like, I, like my family's yelling at me, everybody's yelling at me. And I'm like, look, if it goes off the fucking rails, 
be prepared for it and go with it. It's going to be a much more memorable night if everything goes to shit. Right. I mean, and that's mm-hmm. the job of the actors to know the full story. But I had control know. over that. Right. Right. And, and I had to make my thing. peace with it. I, I don't know how to make my peace with that as an mm. audience member. See, and, and that's the thing. So as an actor, I mean, at least myself, um, I have no formal training of acting. So a lot of it is just very organic. I think you have it or you don't. Yeah. I don't think I don't think somebody can teach yeah. you. I mean, there like, are technical. Somebody can skills. teach you. Somebody can teach you how to play like Eric Clapton, but only Eric Clapton can play like right. Eric Clapton. Of course, of course, right. yeah. And so, for myself, when I would learn my lines, the, actually, that was the last thing I did. Um, You're pretty fearless, by the way. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. I can't. Well, yeah. when I when it comes, I mean, to I wasn't like jump off the roof. But it was like, it was like, what do you think if you try that? And you're just like, yeah, fuck yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and I, was, and I looked at her going like, oh, and no we did never commercial. listens to me that way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, you and I were on the same page. Yeah. It was, it was supposed book, to be fun with and the, cute. With the, yeah. the manual in the, in the car. Yeah. And I'm like, and you're like, when you, when you hold it up in front of your face, could you have it upside down? I'm like, oh my God, I was yeah. thinking the same yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, and that's, and that's just shows you a sign of filmmakers who like to work with the same people again and again. I would love see to that, work with the same people again You know, and again. cause Kevin works, we work with our same people again and again. Spike Lee does the same thing, you know, Scorsese with uh, DiCaprio and that yep. circle. It's, mm-hmm. and people are always like, why are they always working with you? We give us other actors a chance. And well, it's they just, keep the same technicians too. Correct. Exactly. The yeah. sound guy knows how the sound wants <laughs> yep, to be mixed up. Guy. Yep. You want the same kind of lighting and set director to kind of dresser well, as well. Because it's so symbiotic. Like when you work together. You don't together. have to say much. Right. Mm-hmm. But you know how hard it is trying to start just to hit a stride with someone. Right. You know? right. It's like, oh, we're new. You don't know. You know, I remember this story about Kubrick, his first film where, you know, I mean, he told the DP, he's like, put a 50 on. They do the shot. The DP put a 25 on. He goes, what, what, what lens did I tell you to put on? And he goes, well, 50, but I thought a 25 would be better. He goes, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to fire you. Right. Do it my way. Yeah. I know what I'm talking about. I'm a photographer, all this shit, you know? So, but I just watched an interview with Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill just directed his first movie. It was mm-hmm. that skate movie. I forget the name I of it. I can't wait. I love Jonah Hill. And he said, he's like my number he said, one. You know, <laughs> he was on Howard Stern and he's like, how did you like get respect? And Howard St- and Jonah Hill was like, you can't, and this, I told you this, he goes, mm-hmm. you can't be self-deprecating. Mm-hmm. He goes, people have to trust you. You can't go like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Right. Um, right. Because they're not going to believe you. Or like going into battle. Or you really do respect the people who are around you. And like, because even Kevin has said this, Kevin Smith has said, like, look, uh, camera, I, this is what I kind of want. You pick the lens for it. And then if I go, yeah, you know what? Let's pull that back then. Now, over all these years, he knows what lens he wants and stuff like that. But in the beginning, sometimes but you got to really think you, he truly didn't know. Or do you think he had like some idea? He had some idea, but he also trusted all the DPs he's ever worked mm-hmm. with for the most Which part. Which you have to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have right. to. I mean, that's that's what they studied. And they study a very technical aspect of it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You need to know focal distance. You need to know lighting. And you need to know what, you know, when you would compensation mm-hmm. yeah. of that and stuff like that. And you got to make sure that you have the right hood on it and stuff like that. And uh, so, you know, you got to respect the DPs uh, at what they do. Mm-hmm. But there are those DPs that want to, you know, step over that line and yeah. go like we should frame it like this because of whatever and I'm yeah. just and you go all right but that may be great for your reel but I don't know if it's great for what the story technique I'm trying to I tell saw you. DP once fuck up a shot for two and a half hours because he didn't want to do it because the director wanted it yeah you no know, I've, I've it's, it was seen like a steady that. cam and he, he would always go like Poof, and fuck the frame up yeah so and he was it, sabotaging it every time yeah they do it all the time yeah yeah there yeah. there there are guys who are but like but I that. think that there's no respect there right so but that that's when I say to the guy well then you need to go do your own movie yeah and then do your own movie and DP your own movie so what this leads to another question you know in your experience whether it's theater whether it's you're recording an album whether it's film whether it's television um, any any art form that is not a solo endeavor how important is it for people to kind of like know your lane stay in it because that's why you're there. Because when I when I moved out from LA, they're like, do not tell anybody what film school you went to. Don't even put it on your resume. Mm. And I'm like, why? And they're like, because all of our students go out there and literally look at the DP. It's their, first, their PA. Mm. You should put a 650 over there. You yeah. know, and you're fired. You're immediately gone. Who the yeah. fuck are you? Uh, I mean, the, my, my immediately slap uh, for that was going from clerks to mall rats. Here it was. We went from doing our own thing where everybody was doing themselves. Is that uh, a big like change? Uh, well, three people making a film to a, a crew of 120. Yeah, I think that's a big change. Did, you walk, did you walk out and say, be like, this is different. Well, I flew in to, we were <laughs> shooting up in Minnesota, Minnetonka, Minnesota. We took over the Eden Prairie Mall up there to shoot mall rats. And they had been shooting already, I think about a month maybe. 
and uh, or maybe two weeks. And I flew in. I was going to be there for 11 days. So I fly in. We've taken over an entire mall. And right. the mall was brand new. So a lot of the other stores, the anchor stores were there. It was like a Target, a Kohl's, I think a Lord & Taylor, yep. a, a Sears and like a Lord & Taylor, something like that. And so um, the rest of the smaller stores had not filled in, had not been rented yet. So production in saving money, we took over stores as different departments. So one store was camera department. One store was wardrobe. One store, two whole storefronts alone. One was Shannon Doherty's dressing room and the other was Shannon Doherty's like lounge, so to speak. No. And then, you know, then, then there two was, stores. And then, yeah. And then there was a whole three stores that were all the dressing rooms <coughs> that they built all like fake walls and stuff for dressing rooms. Right. So, and then one depart, one store was costumes and one department was, you know, makeup department and stuff like that. So I flew in, they took me from the airport right to the set to go to wardrobe to try on what I was going to wear as Gil Hicks for mall rats. Go there, do the fitting. Things are great. They put my costume in a, you know, a garment bag and hang it on a rack. And uh, and then they said, oh, if you go four stores down to the right is the dressing rooms. Uh, Your dressing room will have your name on. I'm like, great. So I came from, obviously, Clerks was the first film and only film I had done at that point. I come from a very theater background. You do everything yourself for the most part of theater. So I grab my garment bag. I head out the store door and walk, start making the right and we started walking out. I got maybe two store fronts while I'm hearing, Hey, Hey. (laughs) And I stop and I look back towards wardrobe and this girl is running down at me. And uh, she comes up to me. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm going to my dressing room. I'm at, did I, was I supposed to go the other way? She goes, no, no, no. What are you doing with the costume? I'm like, oh, I was taking it to, to my dressing room so I'd have it in my room so I can get dressed. She goes, she grabs it from me. That's my job. Don't grab costumes. Okay, just put them on. I'm like, wow. oh, okay. Wait, you don't touch costumes. You just put them on. Just put them on. When they're in your room, that, <coughs> when, you, when they're in your room, then you can touch them and wear them and do what you right, want. Right. But when we have them, we have them. Oh, okay. And so then she proceeded to then walk with me to my dressing room, which if she had just done that from the beginning, it would have been cool, right? right? Like, I, you know. Somebody wasn't paying attention to their uh, job. No, no. She was doing other things and I didn't need to get into costume at that moment anyway, but I thought I was doing kind of like the- A favor. Act, right, not, but not at a, the same Not time. a favor, just like this is what I've always done. I've yeah, grabbed my costume. I have plus no problem I'm, carrying my own shit. Plus is I'm she, a little anal retentive like that. Like, well, now that my costume has been set and that's that's mine- don't anyone touch it because I don't want to lose my costume because it's right. on me, right? right? Kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. But so when I got to the dressing room, she hung it up, and I was like, "Oh my god, thank you so much! I'm so sorry." She goes, "Just and she goes, just so you know that like we're on a union shop shop now, and this everybody has their own job and stuff. Like you, you barely have to do anything except just do your, you know, go up and do what you need to do." I'm like, "All right, sweet, thank you so much." But I mean, it makes sense because that she is responsible for wardrobe, so they got to keep. No, I get it, ca- and I completely got it at all times. <clears throat> There's an argument to be said, and it's not me being a piece of shit or trying to be a piece of shit, is is that, you know, in terms of, like, the film business, like, if I wanted to make, if I knew enough people with enough talent who don't work in the film business but can do all the different jobs that I want them to do in the film business, can I make a $40 million movie for $6 million? I mean... Or do I have to go through all the hoops and all the stuff where it's like you jump into a new tier once you make this much money at the union say that you have to pay this, you have to do that, you know? And I always wondered like, well, why, why does it have to cost that much? Why does it have to be that much where it could be an independent film with a smart budget, but you don't have to, you know what I mean? It sounds really like how they would do it in the Philippines. <coughs> Well, I mean, but that's, that's sweatshop. That that is the the trick about trying to get quality production value uh, out of paying not so exorbitant rates, so to speak, um, but also having the talent to then to the be a part of it. And that's where well, it's like trying to get a SAG actor. If it's like we only have enough money for like two hundred dollars, I'm not saying that this is what it is. I'm just saying like a lot of the local filmmakers that we're with, this is what they're up against. Well, I mm-hmm. yes, and I, and I know the the wall that SAG kind of puts themselves up in uh, when it comes to that. And to be honest with you, it, that would be not such a hard wall to get over if other productions, once again, paid into SAG. Right. And that's that's the problem is it's almost like, funny enough, the healthcare system yep. again. If enough people pay into it, if there's a lot of people paying into it, then SAG can say, yeah, we can drop the the requirements because we're we're being funded by all these other streams of yeah, being we're cash funded. rich right now. We're good. Right. Yeah. But then there are things like they just had a major strike a couple of months back for video game voicing. 
mm-hmm. and you know, and you got to pay those artists their their fair share of rate and stuff like that. Especially video games, they sell millions and millions. And just mm-hmm. so you know, the la- the trend in the last it's like an eighty billion six, dollar year business. Six or seven years now is if you're a screenplay writer. You almost can sell your script much more lucrative, especially if it's a playable world, so to speak, an action adventure, whatever it is you're, you're writing that's episodic, especially that they can do more episodes of the game. Right. That if you sold it to a gaming company rather than try to make your dream come true with a film. Now, granted, you probably won't see first sell one of your dream for four or five years because that's how long the programming takes to develop right. video games and then the voicing of it and stuff like that. But it's that type of the thing that the artists are going up against. And then the fact that our people are YouTubing now and podcasting that the amount of entertainment, the amount of content that's produced every single day of every world there is, be it films, be it television, be it music, be it streaming, be it news radio, be it uh, gaming, be it whatever. There's t- we are making like 20 years worth of content like a day. In, in, in one year. Like literally, you know, there's no way you could see and do it all. Um, and in the meantime, how do you fund it all? And how do you, you know, how do you That's fund the thing that, that we're trying to understand? Like, where's it's all this fucking money? How, how, to, how to monetize it? That's why you have the Patreons and you have the, the, the people who, you know, have exclusive content. Please pay us and, and sponsor us and be our Patreon to do more of this type of stuff. And that's the world that even podcasters are going through as well. And it's tough. And then you get the people who have that very, very rare needle in the haystack kind of career like a Kevin Smith who does do podcasting at, you know, comedy clubs. And I don't think there's anybody out. else like him. Mm-hmm. There is as it. far as like media. there is. I mean, there are other people who 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 are kind of part of that. Like you know, Spike Lee has that kind of same thing with the podcast, and he has the store in Brooklyn, and he does a lot of things like that, and he does teach, and he does do uh, seminars at, at universities and stuff like that. So it's a lot of entrepreneurship. There, there is. Yeah. It's it's a lot of hustle, bro. There's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of side hustle that's got to go on. There's that you, that you have to do to keep yourself going, and uh, you know. Um, in the meantime, you know, you do what you can. He's extremely prolific when it comes to his comedy writing, especially especially for his live events are very fun. He surrounded himself with some really fun people to bounce off of, like the Ralph Garmans or the... We were there. Yeah, we were at the one yeah. in, yeah. Yeah. in Hollywood. You know, and Mark Bernadine and, and all these other great <laughs> cats in different industries um, who, who do some really great podcasting work with them that, especially when you see it live, it's a lot of fun, especially you have drinks in front of you and, and what have you. Um, so it's a very unique thing. And I know that I hear this from my stand up comedy friends, um, who are like, man, he's taking up, you know, stage time for something. You just sit down and bullshit. I mean, fuck, we've been doing that in the green room for decades. Just yeah, but he's a raconteur, man. Mm-hmm. Correct. Correct. And that's his gift. Yeah. Um, the evening wits really changed me too. Because I was like, this is how the fucking machine works. Correct. And mm-hmm. and hearing the how it is where he was just like, I don't give a fuck if I tell this story. They're never going to yeah. work with me again. And the whole story is with like Bruce Willis and whatnot. Mm-hmm. You know, it's those type of thing in the Superman script and how that went. Bumble war. Toilet. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and so um, it's those type of stories that he just goes, ah, fuck it. And, you know, it's like the Kathy Griffins of the world in the comic world. Where, right. Where they're like, look, I'm going to tell you how it is in backstage of this whole, you know, gab fest. And guess who I saw? And guess who I saw? And she's all about the the, the name drop kind of comedy that she does, right. which is hilarious as well. And then Ricky Gervais is another one. I don't give a fuck, mate. And he just does his own, you know. Yeah. Which if is you're great. offended, good. That's what yeah, I'm supposed that's what to I'm do. About, you know? But sometimes offense is supposed to provoke thought. Correct. Mm-hmm. And that's Correct. his whole thing. Look, I mean, you he's can't not, argue with him at the end. You're like, ah, fuck, he makes so many good points. And he's not mm-hmm. killing anybody with his words. And no. nor, nor is he inciting people to kill people. Not at all. Words. And there were people not like that all. who are in power right now that you got to go, what the fuck? No, you but, he's, but what, what's pissing people off is he's calling people out. Who yeah. is Trump or? No, 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 no the Ricky Gervais. Gervais. Ricky Gervais calling people out. Good. Just like Seth McFarland. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to be a hypocrite. When he hosted the Oscars, that pissed off. A Pe- lot of the establishment, because but that's what he, was he called Well, if you remember when he did his monologue, he called out people and, and stuff like that, which was very like, <gasps> and even when Ricky Gervais, was, whenever he hosted the Golden Globes, I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. And right. I, and I thought, you know what, if you can't, if you can't take the piss, as they say, take the piss out of yourself. Yeah. Seth, what know. did Seth, he made an innuendo about, was it the Weinsteins? Who, somebody who was. Well, I think. He made, oh, no, 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 no. He did it on the announcements. When they were announcing the categories, he said it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah where he's- And it, everybody was like, ooh. Yeah, but the guy, dude, this- It is what it is. The, look, the dude did his thing. Right. Like, it's like Bill Cosby. It's like when you go back to Bill Cosby, you say, do you disregard all that comedy? Do you right. disregard all mm-hmm. that? Or, you know, I wouldn't 
say Gary Glitter, but do we have to acknowledge, do, think that that song never existed? Because, right. you know, no, I, I, could, I could, I could, I could love music and hate the person. Sure. I could love a performance and hate the person. Right. You know, you guys did meet because it's shooting clerks because you played right. Harvey Weinstein, didn't you? I did. Yep. No, I Remember? didn't play. I played or Bob. You played Bob. I'm sorry, but it was allegedly. Great. Yeah, but you know allegedly. You're at, at you know, shooting Brian, clerks. We were in that. We went to that restaurant right afterwards mm -hmm. and it was, it was, it was butts to nuts. Man. It was it gaslight. Was, it was I think the restaurant was gaslight, wasn't it? I we had to walk up like three or four stairs. Yeah, but to I get think because there. there was like. I was standing next to Oric. Yeah. <laughs> and, they, and they had the buffalo. You guys were sitting eating some damn looking yeah. buffalo, buffalo yeah, pork, stuff. something or another. That mm -hmm. we were like, Who this um, is yeah. sorry to interrupt. Tell me there. about the tell me about the the read through and how that came about because you both were there and what is it? it so number one, the read through and then, of Clerk Street you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, over the weekend. And sure. Then, and then what about uh, uh, the 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 playhouse that the, the sure. funds go to? So what happened was this: um, the First Avenue Playhouse, which is still in operation, it's a dessert theater on First Avenue in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. It's one of the most uh, continuously running theaters in New Jersey. Uh, so um, they do productions. A lot of them are like um, Neil Simon kind of productions and stuff like that. They get the rights of some really funny comedies. Most of the time it's comedies. They do do dramas as well. And then especially around the uh, September, October, they do some sort of Halloween horror kind of uh, themed kind of script like we did uh, Dracula, you know, Passion of Dracula. The Frankenstein was done once a couple of times with Mary Shelley and stuff like that. So this theater... Uh, needs to be remodeled, uh, to be honest with you. They need new equipment. They're still using actual bulbed lamps as opposed to LEDs now. Plus, um, did they, they have damage from Hurricane Sandy? Yes, they, they had damage from Hurricane Sandy. The, the, the roof needs, it was patched, but it needs a whole new replacement. It's one of these pitched flat roofs. These fucking places should be our churches, man. Yeah, we they should, should be. We should treat them like our churches. And they're one of the few theater groups that actually owns their theater as opposed to just renting, where right. they were just like, well, this costs too much. We're walking right, away right. and finding a new space. Mm -hmm. They actually have it. Uh, their own building. And then the other thing was they um, they do um, puppet theater as well for, yeah, kids, for kids and school kids yeah. and stuff like that. So uh, they needed about $50,000 in upgrades and repairs. And so uh, people started reaching out. I got reached out, reached to by the, the daughter of the owners and stuff like, like, hey, is there any way you can help us out? And they reached out to Kevin and stuff. And so then Kevin had the idea like, well, why don't we And they we actually just... started a, Go, a GoFundMe. Yeah, they started a GoFundMe, which wasn't getting much traction really. And they, were only, and they were only, yeah, they were only okay. asking for 10 grand at that point. And they were going to see if they can get to that, which I think it's only up to two grand. And so recently I re reposted that GoFundMe again because it's still going on. Um, so then when it reached Kevin's uh, people and also Ernie O'Donnell had heard about it, uh, Kevin's <laughs> like, well, why don't I just read? I'm never going to, what is it that I have that could be something that can help them out instead of, I can't just give them straight money because I don't really, and he's not that kind of, that kind of rich. We're like, here's 50 grand. Yeah. You know, he's the guy who's constantly trying to find funding for his own project. Right. You know what I mean? So he says, but what well, he's an artist. Yeah. yeah. So, but what is it that I have that I could somewhat donate that people would want to see or hear? And so it came to, Hey, why don't we read the clerks three script? Now, when I first heard about it, I thought we were going to try to get it produced as is. Um, and I had connections with another producer that was like, I'd be interested in producing it. Um, but in, it was all about, you know, getting Jeff Anderson on board because like he had pulled out at the last minute uh, last time. So um, when I saw Kevin three weeks ago in San Diego, excuse me, two weeks ago at San Diego Comic-Con, we were out there promoting the new JMU's movie Madness and the Method, the new Jay and Silent Bob reboot, plus Shooting Clerks, the biopic about right. Kevin had a screening out at San Diego. So I had to be out there for at least three things to promote. When I was out there, Kevin was the host of the IMDB boat, which is yep. this big yacht on the back of the uh, convention center in San Diego. For those who don't know, is a big marina. And so there's a lot of these really nice yachts there. And IMDB always hires one yacht to host and do interviews on and throw a party, uh, two parties on during the whole week while you were there. So when talking to Kevin there, he's like, listen, man, I have an idea for Clerks 3. Because I said, hey, man, why are you re reading that script? I thought there would be a chance to get it done. He goes, you know what? I'm never going to do that script. He goes, it's too dark. I was in a, bit, I was in a bad frame of mind back then. Um, I think I can do better for those characters. So, we're, you know, this is something that I was never going to do. And I'm like, all right. Once he said that, I was like, I was cool. Then I'm like, all right, if you have something else that you want to plan, and he's going to reach out to Jeff yeah. personally. Um, Your so, parallel universe, Clerks 3. Correct. It pretty much is the bizarro <laughs> world of Clerks. Right. Um, so um, he's like, we're going to read this to raise money. So that's what he did. So we sold tickets. There was one night only. It can only seat 80. Boom. Within five minutes, that was sold out. So then they said, all right, so let's do a Sunday matinee. 
boom, that sold the other 80. Uh, and then Ernie got a local printing company to donate to the theater 200 of these one of a kind posters commemorating this read. Uh, which we all signed as well. Ernie's uh, a hustler. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. And they, we love him. And they, and they yeah. sold them for fifty bucks each. Fifty bucks each. Dude, which, he's which way to go, Rick. Right. On top Garris. of the hundred dollars, right. on top um, of the hundred dollar ticket. ticket. To come. So yeah, the tickets were hundred bucks plus another. Uh, you know, so they got about just about twenty grand in uh, in all told for that one night. They need fifty, so we're we're looking for more ways. So Kevin is looking to probably he just tweeted this out or posted on his Instagram uh, either early today or late last, last night. night. Um, saying that, uh, um, don't worry, I'm going to be, I'm thinking about doing this again. Uh, so just keep in touch with my socials. I'll make announcements if we book another place to do this again, once again, for the money going towards the theater. Mm -hmm. So we, um, we get there on the, uh, Saturday night, uh, it's sold out and people are already lining up front to get into the building. Um, and we get up there now, Kevin hadn't assigned people their roles. Their roles. Now the, obviously they knew I was playing Dante. And, uh, so, um, People were saying Brian Johnson, if anybody knows Brian Johnson from Comic Book Man. Yeah, we um, hung out with him. Yeah, yeah, I love him. He is the real life inspiration of Randall. When Kevin was writing the first scripts, it was Brian Johnson who was that guy who worked with him at the store, who was the guy who antagonized customers or who questioned people or stuff like that. That's really Brian. Yeah. And if anybody who knows Brian, that's Brian. And he's actually <laughs> even more, he's saltier, saltier than now. the real Randall. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Just on his Twitter. I just, even when he just retweets some random right? stuff, he's yeah. like, just tell her goddamn no. Yeah. You know, just like, that's it. It's, it's And great. he was the one who wrote and directed and co-starred in the movie Vulgar that mm -hmm. we did, uh, which is extremely dark as well. So, um, they thought he was going to rerun a little, but it turns out though. So Kevin comes in, he's and so we give him the list of how many characters are in his script, and he goes, "All right, uh, O'Halloran, you're going to play Dante. Um, you know what? I'm going to read Randall uh, because I think even though Brian Johnson would be perfect because he is the inspiration of Randall, I think I could do what I want Randall to be like. So I'm going to be Randall, and then he said he'll also play Jay. So Kevin played Jay, Randall, and then uh, Silent Bob, obviously himself." Um, and then uh, he assigned, like, uh, there's two detectives in the film. So he gave one to Ernie and one to Brian Johnson. There were two female uh, roles in the script. So the main female role he gave to Marilyn. And then the like the news reporter and other female roles he gave to Diane. And that was the first night. So we did the first night of readings like that. And at well, how times, did it go? How the whole reading it, it went? It went extremely well. It's, a, and it's an emotional roller coaster for the fans. Extremely funny, of course. Um, the, the beginning of the film is, is, a, an opening that's pretty, it's, it's filmed in black and white in the beginning. Uh, and it's pretty kind of like, wow, it sets the stage like, man, things, shitty things have happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you, you know, then, then it's like the, the story takes place six months later. Um, and there's this huge movie that's coming out called Ranger Danger and the Danger Rangers. Uh, the Ranger Dangers, whatever. And so um, it's kind of like the Avengers endgame of their world right. right now coming out. And so there's a big kind of carnival going on outside of this movie theater. And the, the rest of the movie pretty much takes place outside of the movie theater in this kind of tent city that's, you know, this carnival. What? Yeah. Right, because there's some people, people that have actually been waiting in line for months. For months. months. So they kind of camped out in right. this parking lot. Right. So, so it's a tent city yeah, of yeah. people. Oh, it's like when people are waiting for like the Harry Potter Correct. book. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Right. Correct. But, but it goes a little longer in this, in this sure. scenario. So Not days, A month but months. before Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. So uh, it's that scenario where the, the, the most of the story takes place. And it's a fun kind of um, analysis of fandom and fan culture. And what we do as Americans for fans, and you know, as fans and for these films and, and what kind of meaning that these type of films mean to fans. Um, and, it, and it ranges all fans, Star Wars fans, Harry Potter fans, you know, uh, Marvel Universe fans, uh, Star Trek fans. They're all encompassed in this kind of thing. It's a lot of fun. And so it gets dark. A lot of, a, a lot of life issues kick in into the script. Um, and then there's the big finale when the when the movie finally starts. And in between, there's this big event that happens in the carnival. Uh, that's a lot of fun. There's a lot of cameos that pop up in that. And so um, it's it's really something uh, that was dark. It is dark to read. And um, but what themes would you think make it dark? Uh, themes that would make it dark were um, the outside world intruding in on this kind of wonderful kind of event going on kind of thing um so and i think loss and loss you know and people like not not 
not getting what fandom is about and stuff like that. So these type of themes creep in and, uh, you know, eventually Kevin will release a script for everybody to see in some format. But until we, he officially says, all right, I'm done trying to do this reading format of it. We're going to keep it close to the vest. It's like mm-hmm. telling, it's like telling someone who goes on and does stand up comedy and someone says, Oh, I'm going to tell you his entire set. Uh, we're going to try to keep it close to the vet until, vest until he's done. Yeah, that's why I'm just, I don't want to know. I don't want to know what's yeah, going yeah. on. I was just, I was. Did the audience sign NDAs or anything? Uh, <laughs> no, we, I mean, we we asked them. We, we honestly asked them, and we told well, them why. Let, mm-hmm. let me ask you this: it, it, We told them to turn their phones off, and we had security behind. Mm-hmm. So if anybody was coming up with there, and we gotcha. saw that thing was recording, we'd tell them you have to stop. So if we look at if we look at clerks the way my generation knows clerks, you know, clerks one, clerks two. Um, you know, would this be like the, this is definitely the, the, two two worlds colliding, millennials and us Gen Xers colliding. But does it, as far as it stays true to the characters? No, no, no. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that. But it's like, is it one of those where it's it's not, you know, it's not alien. It's aliens. You know, where it's yeah. just so different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, but, I, but were I, they I, with I can you? See where you're going. But that. were they with you? Yeah, oh no, everybody was totally with Oh my us. gosh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. They were they were along for the ride. So and even if that was the shooting script and they went to do it, you think you think everybody who was a fan of those films would, would stick with it. They might be like They would definitely stick with it, but they would definitely know, like, well, that was the last one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? There's no more after that. If this script is shot, this is yeah, there's, there's no there's, ambiguity. There's no there's no ambiguity ambiguity as well, to I what mean, happens. I to mean, these I mean, the beauty about about uh, like especially Clerks One and Clerks Two. I mean, there's there's so uh, there's the colors in the crayon box are still there, but they're used in different ways. Correct, and they're used mm-hmm. in different ways. They're, they they mature more. They deal with bigger problems. Um, well, I mean, it, it, it. Kevin said this even on the night of the readings. He was just like, you know, if you were fans of the original Clerks movies. Uh, and after it's, if you had seen this movie, you would have went. Did someone tell him that they were comedies before? <laughs> yeah, like did this, he is, that this, this is, is supposed, to be, supposed to be a fucking comedy. Like, and he said he's like, look, I, I didn't want to. You go to the movies <laughs> to get away from ah, you know, right. the news every day is like ah, mm-hmm. and you don't want to go to a theater where I'm telling that you where I make this film and it's at you and the screen going ah, mm-hmm. right? You know what I mean? So it was that kind of like uh, we want to get away from that. Um, this was that kind of right. in your face kind of like ah, right? Yeah. And now it's the clerks, bitches. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it was it's not it's not what we want to what how we want it to go. So. The people there were people in the audience, especially I visually saw it on the second day. But there were people in the audience and these are all young people. Yeah. And uh, guys, they they were Fighting back the tears, they were crying. If you can make people laugh and you can cry, you've done your job. Yeah. 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 Oh no, it's, like, it's definitely a huge arc of hey, 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 this is hello. Oh, sh- what are we doing? Yeah, <laughs> but I also don't like the fact that there's like seven assholes that write reviews that dictate what the fuck success or if it's a good movie or if it's not. And I know, and I, this isn't it. The, 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 that doesn't. If one thing you haven't learned from Kevin yet is all right, Mal, he Mal does, got he crushed, does, didn't it? He doesn't give a fuck what people really <clears> say. I mean, yes, we do. I'm mean, like that's not right, but at the same time you go. I mean, I was him from writing I, what I did, he wants. To write. I didn't make that movie for right. them, you know. Yeah. Like I mean, he made Tusk. That is a very niche yeah, that's, audience. That's, that <laughs> when you see Tusk, what that's about. Red State. That's right. Well, yeah, that's well yes, mm-hmm. yes, and no though. But if you look at Red State and then the world we're in today. Not so off, far He's off. He's not wrong. And He's when, not far off. When he was teasing it, going like, eh, it's religious, you know, whatever. And I'm like, oh, what could it be? I thought the best part about that entire movie was the ending. Correct. With so the now, four horsemen of the correct. apocalypse. You now know what's wa- coming. Watch it again. Now with now this, now with this climate day. that we're in, and yes. you're like, holy shit, he's a fucking prophet. <laughs> I, but I don't think he set out that way. I think no, he was not like, at all. this seems the way it's going to go. Not at all. Same thing mm-hmm. with this script of Clerks 3. There are things that are happening in us politically that happen in this uh, this script that you just like, look, I'm not a future teller, but you know, now that I see this, it's just like we're hearing it out and reading it to you. It's kind of weird because of what, what the climate that we're in today. Mm-hmm. So it's that kind of thing where it's just like, you know, it is what it is. And I, and I, once we're allowed to talk about it even more, I'll be I'll come, be more than happy to come back Look, on the it's, show. It, everybody says it probably every single day that if if someone wrote a script about the current administration and president, if someone wrote that script and the things that oh, are that's said, unbelievable, Jesus, like, that's oh, so on, crazy, that's so ridiculous, that's like so Ors- Orson Welles, uh, well, or, you know, Veep, right? No, yeah, 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 we love. I Veep. know, I. <laughs> 
That's no. the only way it is. But the thing is, is like they don't. Can I get a little philosophical for a yeah, second? Yeah, sure. The, I mean, the the world doesn't. I mean, it's it, we're man. It's just so, it's just so crazy because we're, we 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 have lost capacity to critically think. And we have lost the oh, capacity right? to be empathetic. We have lost the capacity to see perspective. I don't. I don't think we've lost it. Yeah. I, I think. I, I, the, I think the people running for office don't care about it. It's been they anesthetized. Don't, no, they, they they don't care about it. They just want to be. Say, a there's a majority of people that have lost critical thinking. They, the average I'm, I'm person talking, who doesn't fo- follow is, the news. This and, is a really mm-hmm. shitty thing to say, but a lot. Look, here's the thing. The the and I do political campaigns around here and they're, they're they're a lot of the times they're exhausting and a lot of the times there's really really great people who deserve it who don't win. Of course, um, yeah, you know, and 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 a lot of the times you have to you have to ask yourself the question was did we fuck up right? Well, did yeah, we as the media team, so you did know, we for as next the messaging time. team, yeah, yeah, fuck up because you have to be able to do a post mortem on your shit so you don't you don't ever make that mistake again. Right. But a lot of the times I'm like, I can't think of anything we did wrong. Like it's perfect. Like every checkbox on who this individual it is and the reach that we had and the name rack and all that stuff. And they just didn't vote it's, for him. And, it's and the it's, demographic. And it's, 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 and, and I think that here's what, what kind of happened is I, I, I think, I think somewhere along the lines, my team decided we're D's and that's what matters. We're the new England Patriots and the R's are the Dallas Cowboys. And that's that's where we're at. And, and you can't have somebody from the Dallas Cowboys talking to the New England Patriots. And the moment they're not on your team, they're the fucking enemy. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to get anything through. And the people I talk to on the street, the people in, you know, Joe Biden's hometown. Yeah. And Hillary Clinton's family. And Hillary Clinton's family. Mm-hmm. I mean, most of these people are purple. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I, civil issues or, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, gay marriage, legalizing marijuana, socially, I don't care. So, socially, socially liberal, liberal fi- economically fi- fiscal conservative, conservative. yes, yep. mm-hmm. which, which is usually, which is usually most people. Yeah. And, but, but nobody talks to those people. They do. It's just that, you know what? Those people are mostly working, so they don't have time to talk to you. Right. That's true. Yeah. I agree. Because they're working. Yeah. Yep. They're working. I mean, the people who get. Uh, phone calls on the polls are either a do unemployed you, or b elderly. Elderly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you do? You, are you? How active are you? Either one of you on social media? Uh, about politics? No, because that is a kettle yeah. of fish. I do not want to start stinking up because it turns into a bucket of twenty week old fucking clams. Uh, uh, I got. I got more. I got the new Shoprite reference just, there. Oh did you hear, Did you hear my engine break on the microphone? Yes. I went, <laughs> Um, it's not. I'm pretty it, active it, it, on, on she's, Twitter. She's she's very active. On I was Twitter. very. I I was active on Facebook, uh, especially yeah, guys, after the election. You guys but then are everybody, old. That's uh, for that's for old people now. It's right. somehow changed. And everybody was getting pissed off. Like, oh, Facebook used to be so. Well, fun. I, I, and I and I pulled off of. I only use Facebook now to promote where I'm going to be next yeah. and promote projects I'm doing. I have not. I have not stayed on Facebook since 2015. I kind of smelled. Things because I would be the one to click on ads and then try to find where that ad came from and going like, why it is fucks some up yeah. families? Why yeah. why is an ad coming from Cyprus? Like what? What's this all well, about? Well, the or, reason why it fucks up families is what you were talking about earlier. Critical thinking. There are people who have it and there are people who don't. Yeah. And if they're in the same family, there's no talking. There's no. Sorry, Uncle Roger. Yeah. You're commenting on yeah. my shit at two a.m. I know what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Go to bed. Wake up in the morning. Go to work. Take care of your fucking wife. You divorced because she's because you're an alcoholic. And stop having opinions and stop throwing shit out there that fucking right, yeah. incites people to be pissed. Right. And so, yeah, and, and right. to be honest with you, no one's going to go, hey, Dante told me I should vote this way, so I'm going to do it. You know? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. <laughs> There's a Did, lot of fans. I think that if you said that, they would. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, even Kevin said this the other night. It's just like, look, if you can't figure out my political leanings by A, the films that he makes, that this is what he said, the films that I make, the fact that I'm a weed advocate and stuff like that, then, and you can't figure out where I am politically and then you understand where I'm coming at with things I don't have to tell you you know that you know this is wrong because of that if you can't figure it out yourself which that's what it should be everybody should be able to figure out I'm really happy the EPA deregulated everything of course because there's nothing better than extra lead in my water yeah Um, and so and ash coal ash Mm, coal ash is so tasty um, and so, what is that? yeah, coal ash. Oh my God. It's great. It's on barbecues. It's awesome. Who makes um, that Zima? Yeah, exactly. So it's that type of thing where 
if I started getting into a political kind of issue on a Facebook, or I've seen my friends do it, and I just see how immediately just goes stupidity, more stupidity, and even more stupidity. And it's like, you know what? I'm not talking politics anymore. I'm just talking my level of morals. My, my, my morals are at this level, okay? And there's a certain level of, I'm not going to go below those morals. Right. Every once in a while. Whether that's a red thing, a blue thing, purple thing, yellow thing, tri-color uh, rainbow thing, or whatever it is. I'm sure you can find people with nuts, you need people to tell the nuts. story. You need to tell the story about, I know it happened with a couple of fans, just like one, two, three maybe. Um, he doesn't re he doesn't retweet on Twitter political things. He doesn't comment on political things, but he follows what I retweet or comment on. So he'll just like it. Yeah. So that's it. That's it. But he'll I, have fans I, are you who likes what you did. Are you, are you talking about the fan who was like, "Hey, man, this is America." Blah blah blah. And then you ended up right, checking right, out right, his. Right, right, right. Talk about that guy. So uh, there was a story about the Kaeper- uh, Colin Kaepernick thing, mm-hmm. right? Nike. Yeah. And stuff. This is before the, the Betsy Ross flag shoe thing, which I think was a whole setup personally. But that's just me. Um, uh, so he was take. You know, I I liked something, and that's now it. just if you liked it, if you go on someone's Twitter and you can see tweets. Tweets and retweets, likes, media, then likes. You can click on their likes to see what they've been liking. That's all I did was like. It was a like story about Colin Kaepernick. I agree that taking a knee, that the people of color do get treated much more differently, in uh, especially uh, when stopped by the police in cars and stuff Absolutely. like that. It's something I believe, and that's it. There's no I other, don't have to agree. It's th- science says there's it's no, real. Right. There's no argument. For, I don't want to argue it with anybody. I don't want to argue with a cop or whatever. So anyway, so I had a fan met per- personal message me, like I am me. On Twitter, saying, "Hey, man, I saw you liking. I, I can't. I got to stop following you. You're liking all this kind of uh, uh, really liberal stuff, and that Kaepernick thing just really pushed me over the edge. Uh, and uh, and you should, and you should, and, and I'm not. And I've stopped buying Nikes because of that. And blah blah blah. And I was like, okay. So I go to this guy's profile, and I go, and I see the things that he is. A, he's based in Chicago, huge Chicago Cubs, uh, Chicago Bears fan, and blah 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 blah." Come to find out, he entered a contest to win a Chicago Bears jersey. Chicago Bears jerseys are, guess what, made by the company Nike. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to him and I retweeted (laughs) his post back to him now and still in the private message form. I'm like, hey, man, I don't go after anybody about their politics whatsoever. But something kind of tickled me pink about your comment. I said, you said that uh, you didn't like the fact that I liked the story about Kaepernick taking a knee and that you're going to boycott no- boycott Nike and da-da-da-da-da. I can't help but notice a, a mere seven hours earlier, you entered a contest. Seven con- hours? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. You entered a, con- <laughs> a contest that the, the Chicago Bears are throwing to win a signed, jer- a signed Bears jersey. <laughs> and guess what, son? I said, that jersey's made by Nike. Are you now going to rescind your entry into that contest because you know I'm just saying it's Nike and that's who you said you were gonna boycott and then and I said to him just so you know he goes uh, he got back to me saying something to the effect of like hey man uh, I didn't even know that and uh, yeah maybe I, you shouldn't and I, talk because I said to him it's like because I would I I could have easily have put you on public blast with this whole comment <laughs> and taken a screenshot and showed your ignorance to the, your own comments mm-hmm. I said it's best for you to do research before you blast someone about their politics absolutely yeah, that was it and he's like oh you know what man uh, no one uh, it's very cool of you to be this way and not put me on blast I'm sorry I made the comment I should think before I say something and I wrote. That's all I ask. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you might have got a fucking life lesson out of it. Right. Yeah. Right. For right. sure. So Aim, here's an example. Shoot. Mm-hmm. He doesn't even Kudos get involved to you in for the, doing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Seriously. It is what it is. So even, even not reposting or commenting, but just simply, you know, liking something that I'm retweeting because it's, he's liking what I retweet. Sorry, dude. Mm-hmm. You're his lady. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's not only, I mean, and then there are things that I'll find on other politicians or other organizations that I like, and then I'll send it privately to her and like, hey, look at this story you should be looking at. Mm-hmm. And that's that's where, as far as my politics in the public arena go, it's just me looking at Twitter, me looking at different websites and stuff like that. I pulled away from Facebook because I saw all the fo- fake kind of influential kind of um, media that was being put out there. 
And so I used to be a guy who was on it every day. And every day I would check whose birthday it was. And I'd be like, happy birthday. Hope today is awesome. And people, fans would be like, oh, my God, Dante said hello and happy birthday. Yeah, to but me. you're yeah. given a little bit of sunshine in right? somebody's and I get possible that. cynical life. Right. Mm-hmm. But then when I just kept seeing all this, like, gun rights stuff and all this other stuff, I was just like, all right, I got to back out here. And I just got to concentrate on me and my yeah. and my, yeah. my mm-hmm. career. And, and I don't really, you know, I, I, I like the fact that I can find out. Oh, my friend's daughter's birthday was awesome. Look at the photos and stuff like that. It's great. Well, but, uh, I keep I, I you up to date right, on things. And, and she's like, oh, have you seen? And then I'll log in when she tells me like, oh, so-and-so's had such a lesson. I'll look at it. And I'll make comments and then I'll log off again. Um, did, you, did you ever notice that when you do some when you do some stuff like that, that you, you, you catch yourself smiling and don't realize it? When oh, when I happy. see other people's stuff? Like uh, a relative, like maybe a niece or a nephew no, or a I do. cousin, and I you're do. watching it, and it's yeah. just you, and, and you're I like, it. oh, I'm And I do, smiling. and I enjoy it. And and don't get me wrong, there are, there's a lot of benefits to what Facebook has done for people. But at the same time, until we're out of this period that we're in politically, I don't want to go back on it. You, you just have to, you have have to just change your... We should talk after this. You know, it'd be, it'd be hilarious if all of a sudden Joe Biden gets the nomination, and then, you know, he, he announces... He bring- he na- he he announced. Let me tell this wife. <laughs> oh my God! You want to jump on years. all my all my observations? She wants to jump on it. And my and dick then, size wouldn't is fourteen it, inches. Wouldn't, four wouldn't, inches. It, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be awesome if all of a sudden he brought as his running mate back Obama and just the red stage where just heads would explode? You know what it'd be? It would be the episode of Chappelle's show with Clayton Bigsby. Right, exactly. <laughs> And you know it would be good though, it, like, and I would get the guy who does takes his hood off, and the white guy in the audience is right. fucking explodes. And I would, and I would get the guy who now does all the action movies. It came from they came from Washington D.C. Last time he was in charge, but now Biden's in charge. You know what I mean? And where he's like Louise and Thelma, right? Where, where, where yeah, exactly? Where, where Joe Biden's like. I'm not too old for this shit and anymore. And constitutionally, he could do that. He, he can. can absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He can absolutely mm-hmm. constitutionally. I just don't think Obama would do it. No, he no. would not. And not in a million he years. But I think I, I, I would just find it so funny to, to, to see that happen. I think, uh, I think uh, that the next, what's it, 18 months? Yeah. 18 just long about. fucking months. It's going to be. October, November, it's probably going to be one of the yeah. darkest periods in our country, and I think um, there's an absolute possibility that this man can get reelected. Absolutely, no, um, no. If we don't pay attention, that that'll, that'll definitely happen. I don't know who's advising the Democratic Party as a whole, but they should be fired. Well, you know, we this can go into a other three hour. Discussion. Yeah, yeah. Which we'll do yeah. the next one. <laughs> um, but. Um, I was uh, say. <laughs> but it's the type of thing where, look, everybody is on their own plan of how to frame their message and capture the message that uh, the non-voting Democrats, especially of the African-American uh, female and male uh, sector of the, the electorate. And they keep the saying the young people. And young, young people. It's, it's something like 70% again. of African-American voters are with Biden. Now. Right, yeah. right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. But they have to come out and vote. You could say that, but you have to come they, out and vote. They will. I mean, I, and then I, I, what happens if he doesn't become the actual nominee? You know, we're still very early on. Even even Obama was Obama nowhere was near nowhere this. near this. Correct. So yeah. something can happen. A boot edge edge and or or a Beto. Beto is now getting a big upsurge because unfortunately this shooting happened in his district and in the city. But you know what he did. So here's what we're normalizing. Um, this, uh, in essence. Uh, a group chat dialogue mm. like the old fucking AOL. You're like, talking about yeah. 8chan and 4chan? No, no, no. Are those, are, those are just dirty places of the internet. We yeah. want to go, we want to go back to AOL instant messenger or ASL. Like the forums you know, or the that, chat group right? yes. forums, you know, where it's like, no, fuck you. No, you're a piece of shit. No, you come from a shitty place. No, you do that. We're normalizing. Name that. age, please. Oh. Right. Yeah. ASL. <laughs> um, <laughs> M seven Poughkeepsie. I'm not going. Um, <laughs> it seems it seems that you now seeing you're now starting to see because I've been a fan, I've been a fan of politics ever since I was like since Michael Dukakis ran. Wow. Um, and, uh, and, I, and we I all see, remember that tank and that oversized uh, helmet. What are you crazy? Get out of the tank. <laughs> it was awesome. Get out of yeah. the fucking tank. It was awesome. You might as well have been in a awesome. unicorn life draft. <laughs> raft. What are you doing? It was awesome. Um, he. <laughs> The rhetoric now where, where it's it's our politicians are now cursing at each other, literally. Like 
that's bullshit. That's and this, even on Twitter. That's that. They're doing it on Twitter. Ugh. We're normalizing this behavior. We well, want part, the people. We well, want our, we yeah, want but our part leaders. of it is is justified. Like Beto O'Rourke yesterday was talking to the press, and he was like, was "What the phenomenal. fuck?" But, but that was, was that was organic. That was like. I don't think he went to. I don't think he went far enough. No, no, I don't either. I don't think he went far enough. Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. It was. You know, have been people deeper. are talking this way. Our politicians, uh, the Democrats, I'm, I'm talking about. They're going to just because we're outraged. We're outraged that what we're. Well, I mean, the, people can say that on the previous eight years with Obama when the Tea Party stirred up because they this fucking is, hated this him. This is an outrage. Well, let's be honest, why he hated them. It was it, racism. It was, yeah, it was straight up. And, straight yeah, up racism. That, that just me. And if you're unfollowing me as we speak, oh, I'm so sorry that I. I <laughs> yeah, that cut I the politics, man. Yeah. We don't want to get anybody in trouble. Yeah, but, Brian's um, <laughs> handle is at Seafish yeah. Girl 27. <laughs> Dude, Twitter. you weren't supposed to tell them. <laughs> So go and follow him. Yes, <laughs> him. He, that's a non-binary actual account. Good. What's 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 next for either one of you? What's what's in the hopper? What's in the agenda? Um, I have a the producer I worked with for uh, Jay's movie Madness and the Method. We're talking about working on something, perhaps, yeah. perhaps shooting uh, beginning of next year. Uh, I'm very excited about that. Probably shooting in England again. Um, they have a very uh, good crew, and they get a they get a good tax credit over there as well. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Filmmaking now is um, multi, multinational, yeah. um, in the sense that you know, in the early days of the '90s, everybody was going up to Canada. We shot our film up there yeah. and got tax. And we kind of they were having a hard time. And they were having a hard time even then, but now they're not. And and then all of a sudden, the people of Georgia got mm-hmm. got wind of it and was like, we should do this. And then North Carolina, and then so the southern uh, eastern United States started to give really good tax credits and tax breaks. And the weather there was kind of for the most part stable. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had some really great locations there. Um, and the fact that you can't you can't even. Film yourself taking a fart in Los Angeles without someone go. <laughs> you have a permit. <laughs> like so er- everybody is savvy there. There are dishwashers that they know want about their per- money. They want their money, and yeah. I get it. And I get it. That's all well and good, but at the same time, you're totally just mi- forcing people out of your state by the mm-hmm. droves. I know yeah. people like yourself and other friends who have moved to Atlanta now. But yeah. now with I've, the I've political. But then while now once again the political weirdness that's going on with them and the anti abortion oh, yeah. laws that now we people, had to deal with that you through a third out. party. Do you want to know a crazy thing happening tomorrow? What's that? One of my great friends from Los Angeles who I met in film school. I've known him for the 12, 13 years. Okay. Is moving from Los Angeles to Scranton tomorrow. Woohoo! Wow, congratulations. Wow. He goes, I'm going to get the fuck out of there. Let's see what happens in Scranton. And I'm like, dude, we can film anywhere. All I got to do is call somebody. Yeah. Like we, no, permits, no permits, no, no money. Nothing. We can go wherever we want to go. Yeah. We can do what we want to do. And with the tax credits, you can get up to 30%. Get tax now, yes. you're not going to have them listen to this podcast because there was four moments in this podcast <laughs> like, now I hate this, but you know, you were getting kind of <laughs> yeah. down about filming out here. Oh yeah, but I need you know. But it's like what you said. You need those creative friends around yeah. you, even yeah. though even though you're breaking each other's balls for poker. Yeah. It's coming mm-hmm. from a grand place, and part of me kind of thinks it's like everyone who's going through their shit. It's their night to let off steam, and no one's going to be upset about it. Is he, you guys are all like family? And is he bringing more equipment because then you'll reach that equipment threshold and get yourself that grant? Yeah. Good. Mm-hmm. We're getting good equipment. We're getting really good. Make sure equipment. you get that guy who comes in to do the evaluation. The really. <laughs> Assess it at a higher value. Yes, no, yes. That's where in this. That's why we're in this warehouse. Nobody yeah. knows where we are. Yeah, Everybody I was wondering. Here, they're like, where? Honestly, I thought I was getting whacked when I first walked in the Everybody door. Everybody walks in. Saying, My wife works at that restaurant over there, uh-huh. and for the first year, she goes, "What are you doing at the porno studio?" Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> did they? Honey, no one wants to see me naked. Have they actually? Did, was this Has the Van? I- ever happened? Was no. this the Van Eyes of, uh, of no. Pennsylvania? No, I thought that was Chatsworth. <laughs> no, it's Van Eyes. Uh, um, who just broke out? Was that you? Me. Were you touching your microphone? I did, I'm sorry. All right, so what's what's next? Uh, so there's that. Um, we're promoting the Jay and Silent Bob uh, reboot release. Now, now that's going on tour, right? Jay and Kevin are going on tour with right. that. So it's filling like 2,000 to 3,000 to even higher screen seat theaters. 
Uh, you'll see the screening with a Q&A to follow, which usually lasts like a good two, three hours if anybody has seen any of the Jay and Silent Bob get old. Kevin talks mm-hmm. like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. And even when we did our, our reading the other night, I mean, it was two questions, three questions in, and it was three hours deep. Yeah. Um, and, uh, he, and he could do it. I can do it. We That's the one thing we all have the skill of. Jay does it on his own one-man yeah. show, the amusement. Good for him, The dude, amusing man. stories. He's come over a lot of yeah, shit. Yeah, he has. Yeah. He mm-hmm. has. And so we all have that kind of storyteller in us to do it. Um, so it's not it's it's not strange that it happens. So that's going on tour with Kevin and Jay. Um, you can go on, I think, a reboot film tour dot com or something like that. Or Jay and some. I'll have to look it up. Um, but uh, there's that. Then we have a that's out now. Is the uh, Madness and the Method is out now. I have another film that's making. Uh, it's uh, it's an independent film that we shot. Uh, just over the river in the uh, southern end of New Jersey called um, Right Before Your Eyes. It's a, a faith-based film. It's about a young man. It's about a man who's uh, got an alcohol problem. Yeah. Uh, and his I wife, can relate. And his <laughs> wife leaves him with their seven-year-old autistic son. Oh, Jesus. And his struggle to get back to his family and get sober. I play one of the fa- one of his friends who are, like, or is his drinking buddy, but sees that he's gone way too far with right. this and it is a disease. Um, so it's been submitted to quite a few film festivals and nominated and nominated. nominated. And a lot of them are the Christian, already. Christian film already. festivals. Yeah. yeah. It's so fabulous. I, I, I it was, really is great. It's a huge market. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's the Dallas Christian film festival. I was nominated for best, um, uh, supporting, supporting role, uh, in a, in a feature. The feature itself has been nominated a few times in a couple of the film festivals. It just was at the uh, Philly independent, uh, film, uh, festival, um, two months ago. It was like April or May. April, yeah, I think it was April, where it won award for best first feature for the filmmaker. Oh, um, it was. It really was. Done so it's a it's a nice well. it's a nice uh, touching story. It's something that you'd see probably on like the Hallmark Channel or things like that, or the Weed Network or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. So he's in the process of getting that distributed. Uh, so that look for that probably by the fall. Um, and then there's two other films that hopefully I'll be working on. Kevin talked about obviously reworking the Clerks 3 script, so that's something probably won't happen. Filming probably, if it, even if we got all the ducks in a row, probably won't happen until we start filming in the fall of next year, I, I would I say. Think, I think even those big gaps in between the movies is good. Mm-hmm. Well, no, in the meantime, I do the, the Comic-Cons. Uh, every once in a while, I do stand-up, um, which I'll go out and I'll do um, a good <laughs> are you even, are you, how, you, how are you enjoying stand-up? I, I love it. It's that's that's another gym to me. That's another workout to work out my timing. Would you would you come funny. would you come hang out one day to I, I'm a friend. I'm friends with a couple of local comedians that are awesome. There's yeah. And there's a club here in town that everybody keeps telling me about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they keep telling me that I could do yeah. uh, I should I should do uh, I get hooked up half hour. Can't promise here. you millions. No, but. no, no. <laughs> and, and see, that's another one that I don't go there at all for the money because a the money's not there. The open tab is uh, is usually helpful enough. Um, bar tab um, <laughs> and, and a driver and uh, for my last joke why the chicken cross the fucking road <laughs> <laughs> we're all out of chickens cause you're all vegans do you know my favorite chicken cross the road joke Dead. is why why the rooster cross the road why well, cause his dick was stuck in a chicken no <laughs> okay I thought that was funny that's a good one so what do you what's, what's with you cause you, you actually have like a huge story too but I do. What do you got mm-hmm. going on? Oh, yeah. yeah you and you I do. talked about this, babe. <laughs> when you came into yes, town, we talked yes. about your, your past, your history. Oh, oh you know uh, that, I mean? that, that, that. Yeah, I'd yeah, like yeah. for you to come back. We talk about that, too, if oh. that's okay with you. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great. Oh, she's yeah. she's a I do fan. coaches versus cancer every year. Yeah, so. she, yeah. Uh, for those who are like, what are they keeping secret out there? She is a three <laughs> cancer survivor. She um, has a tail. Yeah, she has a tail and <laughs> a medical tail. And so... Uh, She's yeah, really good at re- at researching and stuff like that. Uh, thankfully, she's twelve and thirteen years free. I know, yay! Fucking um, remission. Are you, are you in remission or are you like? I I don't even know if those words mean anything anymore. Meaning like remission or cured. Or, yeah, but I don't think you're ever cancer free is the term cancer I like free to use. Is a good, good uh, term. September sixteenth will be uh, fourteen years colon cancer free. Wow, and then. Um, October 27th, it'll be 15 years breast cancer free. Holy shit. Yeah. And then I don't count the other one. I had gotten basal <laughs> cell. No, seriously. Hey, it, was yes. a small, it was a small little yeah. cancer cell on my skin. It was um, basal cell carcinoma, but this teeny tiny little nothing. What were they just like? Uh, yeah, I saw it. I thought it was a mosquito bite because it was really tiny. 
And um, and it That's wasn't. Yes. <laughs> and it was uh, nothing. It was like if you. It, it was like the cold of. Cancer. Oh, they freeze it. Uh, no, that they they didn't. They actually very carefully cut it off so that they could do pathology on it. Right, right. When they freeze sure them, groovy, groovy. they know that they're they're nothings. Yeah, and then it falls off. Is that this, benign? It, so it wasn't benign. It, it, it was came malignant? Up, yeah, it was um, basal cell. But there's right. different kinds of skin cancer. And right. in the skin cancer world, this is like the cold of the, meaning like the common cold yeah, yeah. as opposed to the flu of skin cancer. It's the kind of cancer that typically does not spread uh, because the really bad melanomas, right. what they do is it's not spreading on the surface. Right. It's spreading inside your body. Like mm-hmm. you don't know. It's like MRSA. Correct. Yeah. Correct. yeah. yeah. Terrifying. So, but you could do an entire three hour show of yeah. yes. history. But yeah, would, you, so, would you want to come yeah, back and do that? You? Yeah. Cause right. We'll get, Cause we'll we talked about food, man. <laughs> Cause we talked about the, 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 the fundraiser stuff. No, the fundraiser thing that you do every year. Yeah. You guys, yeah. Oh, you know what you should do next? Uh, this may, may of next, next year. May, next year. Uh, you guys should come and should stay. At, you, I host the thing usually, um, and we we've raised. Um, it's the first. It's the only uh, high school level college first uh, coaches versus cancer organization that has raised the amount of money that isn't located next to like a class A or a, a, is it quad A? Like what? What are the big schools? Division Penn A State will be Division A, <laughs> yeah. right? It's it's they've raised the most money not located next to a Division One school. Wow. Nice. Yeah, we've raised over one point seven million dollars. Wow. Something. Yeah. How many how many years have you been doing it? Um, well, this, right, this was eleventh. Yeah. Wow. This was eleventh. Yeah. yeah. And only for the last like six years, I've been doing videos. We do an honoree. It's beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. lot of fun. There's 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 booze and. Everyone wears sneakers and dresses Everybody up too, sneakers. which is great. Everybody wears sneakers. You can great. wear a suit with sneakers. That's well, what I Stacey do. knows I help out with fundraisers a lot. I helped yes. out with the uh, leukemia one. Yep, in the lymphoma society here at the do Radisson. You wanna, do, you, do you guys want to come to the May thing? It'll be cool. Sure. Did Ernie, Ernie came down. to one. Ernie came to the one. Yeah, two years ago. I know, it was seven hundred people at a host. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Now, is there is there like a silent auction with things? Yep. Silent yep. auction. Sure. There's a uh, nice dinner. Uh, 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 the band. We have great bands that show up. Um, that play for the rest of the night. Obviously, we have to have a program to raise money. Cool. Um, but we we usually we get a usually a Division One or Division Two basketball coach uh, to show up. Right so on. last year we had like Jim Beheim. We had nice. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's all these great 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 people involved in it. Um, mm-hmm. So if you guys want to come, man, that'd be pretty. Please send awesome. me the yeah. info. We'd love yes. um, and then uh, the other thing is, is that you know you guys are pretty close by. Maybe we should make a flick. Hey, that can <laughs> we should that can do that. Only a flick that you guys are like the script doesn't suck. <laughs> well, uh, if Di- it sucks, Di- we'll just help improve Di- it. Yeah, Diane tells you I'm I'm very quick. I'm not a, I'm not I'm, I'm not very the, quick to to tell a filmmaker like yeah okay so we need to work with something. <laughs> yeah, I am not I am not the, Werner Herzog the first, or Klaus Kinski. The, the mm-hmm. setup is kind of weak. The finish is great. The way you set that body on fire, it's awesome. I can't wait to film that day, but. <laughs> It now doesn't we, work. We need to get there because, first of all, you're in the Antarctic, and how are we going to set someone on fire in the Antarctic? <laughs> Secondly, yeah. gas is extremely expensive in the Antarctic. <laughs> now, here's the thing. You're going to have to fly your victim in, and he's going to want to be in the Antarctic. How do we do that? Yeah. You know. all this Plus, stuff. our shooting locations are all in Key West. <laughs> yeah, right? So we're going to have to import all this snow. Yeah. So. Um, is there anything else on the horizon or, or you know? Uh, next Comic Con. If you want the Comic Con schedule, uh, next yeah, Comic Con, just do uh, promote it. Yeah, promote sure. Away, so man. I'll be down at Bubba Fest. That's right. It's Bubba Fest, folks, down in Knoxville, Tennessee. Does it have anything oh, to do with Bubba so Hotep? Fun. Nope, not okay. at all. Uh, but that's uh the twenty fourth and the twenty fifth is the actual convention. I'll be there on the twenty third though for their VIP party for those VIP Ooh. people. Uh, and then after that, um, I'll be doing a, another charity event down in New Orleans called Wigging Out for Willow. Um, that's going to be down. Yeah, not again. That's going to be down for a, it's a rare, 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 uh, disease. Uh, oh, now um, I feel like an asshole. No, 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 that's okay. <laughs> Jesus. And, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, I'll be doing, the, uh, you can go to my Twitter for more information on that. That'll be the first weekend in September. And then, uh, hopefully I'll be at the Dallas film festival for that, uh, film, uh, right before your eyes. And then October, uh, excuse me, November starts, uh, Rhode Island comic con, which is the first, second and third of November. And then the following weekend, the 8th, 9th, and 10th of November, I'm in Minneapolis, 
Galaxy Con. Minnesota, in don't Minnesota, you know? Minnesota, <laughs> don't you know? In November. Wait, November? Yeah, that'll be fun. Oh, that'll be fun. And then uh, Louisville, Louisville Galaxy Con, uh, same in November, 22nd, 3rd, and 4th. Perfect time to get a jump on your Christmas shopping. And the <laughs> drunkest I have ever been in my entire life, besides New Orleans, was a was a fucking film festival in New Orleans. <laughs> oh, well, or not New Orleans, <laughs> Louisville, Kentucky. Wow, we might have been at that same festival. I've Dear been on a couple. God, the drunkest I've ever been was uh, Austin, Austin, Texas. Uh, I just seven, had a blast in Austin about seven eight years ago um, during their time of drought. Yeah, like, yeah, the yeah, drought yeah. had been going on for like four years. Right. So I was drinking at northeast humidity levels <laughs> when I should have been drinking at southern states of the United yeah, States dry yeah. levels. Yeah. So the dehydration rate, you. the <laughs> dehydration rate went not so quick on me. And next thing I know, I was like, we were going and we were bar hopping. And they were bar hopping. We're going to do shots. We're playing pool. Hey, we're going to do shots. Then we're going to do more beer and have a Lone Star and all this other stuff. And uh, next thing I know, I couldn't remember how I got back to my hotel room. <laughs> um, was there it was, that long ago? Yeah. Do you guys want to? 2011. Didn't I bring you to a couple bars in Scranton? Well, yeah, we, we took her to the one, vault. At least one. What yeah. was the place that we ate? You the were vault. Like, you were like, oh my God, this is all like gourmet stoned food. Yeah, because it was it like was, Big Mac well, pizza. I took a photo. It was you, amazing, we ordered right? like one of everything. Yeah. Fried uh, pickles. Appetizers. It was so good. And you ate one of everything? Really? No, no, no. But they, we all did. We, she, yeah. She she marveled at it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what she does a lot. Like, this looks great. I won't have it. You yeah. guys, how far away are you guys? 25, 30 minutes? From, From here? here? Yeah. 40, 45 minutes. You guys mm. should come in for a dinner and like a yeah, pub. Oh, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm a, I'm, I don't drink all DD. I got, we got rooms. No, she's my, houses. she's my DD. We're good. Nah, no, we're just going to give her some of that glaucoma medicine. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, wowie, it was, wowie. it was great. I woke up in that hotel, didn't even have to, there was a number that said, if you need anything, uh, call here, Melissa. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> I didn't. It was the guy who was the head of this animation studio's wife. Cause we all went up. They carried, I right, remember right, them right. finally. Oh, they, thank God. they carried <laughs> me into the hotel Dead lot, weight. and then carried me up into the room. And I, I remember getting myself undressed. My second worst was New Orleans, Louisiana. When I realized that you can walk around anywhere with alcohol. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm standing in doorways at bars. I'm like, look at all the people. It's so neat. And the, and the bartender's like, you, you in, you walk out. out the door. Right. You in, you out. I'm like, this is like adult Disneyland. <laughs> Which it pretty much is there in Vegas. Oh, I'm, yeah. da- I'm dancing with people from whatever precinct or whatever down in, in on Woods. Yeah, it, Jefferson Parish. <laughs> oh, people who was, it's, it's like, down oh, in Jefferson Parish. Every by the way. ethnicity, every, we're all just dancing. There's, there's a cover band at 4 a.m. <laughs> And then the next, and then the next morning, I feel like shrink wrap shark shit. It was fucking <laughs> terrible. So this past May, uh, for people who don't realize, Mardi Gras goes on from the the ending of January to Fat Tuesday in May or April. It's a while. It is. Mm-hmm. it is quite a while. And so I was asked to be the king of the Chewbacca parade. That's right. I saw that. So the crew of Chewbacca. So they dressed me up in Jedi robes. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. No, I swear to God. So I was the king of the parade. Last year, it was Andy Richter Can from the Conan. On one of the cameras? Yeah. Conan Can I LeBron. text this photo to yeah, myself? Yeah, 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 yeah. Go right ahead. <laughs> what do I hit? The thing that looks like a pencil? Uh, no, no, that's at it. It's the, the, the one that looks like the tree, three dots. Oh. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. You're now going <laughs> to have my number. That's the sound and, of an and, Apple phone woo! user. Yeah. How do I share this? <laughs> I don't know what I to know, do. Me too. I'm sorry. I need to drop sorry. this. I don't know what to and do. And then you can then I go. I Neil deGrasse Tyson. So you can Where's do the me- text message button? It's the red. Two. The message. The red message yeah, the, bubble. It's got like two. Oh, messages. Oh, message. It's red. Message is red with two word bubbles. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. <laughs> don't worry, my I paint chips. You should hold yeah, a picture. Because up. People you like should hold a picture up to one like of the cameras. Like, well, he edits it anyways oh, so to he's go gonna, back and forth between the cameras. Like duh. camera one, camera two. I always two. said people camera like one, you're, you're in the two. film industry. How come you're not an Apple user? I'm like because I like to build my own computers. <laughs> they really. Oh, how does how how does one <laughs> how does how does one create contact? Oh, oh here I'll, I'll create. Just type in your phone number. Come on, Mark. All right, I'm Marky. And I don't know how to spell it. Mary. You should have just. I know. You should have just done it. Yeah, he should have. Oh, this is he fine. Let him do it. He's learning something He's learning. today. I'm yes. just. I'm just. I had my. I'll never forget this. My fifth grade uh, geography teacher said, "All right, kids, Mr. O'Hagan, 
He used to be called, hey, everybody, just call me Mr. O. I was like, oh, my God, another O. That's awesome. Uh, Mr. O'Hagan, uh, we're going to do geography. And he would be the type who literally would do something on the board. And then he'd go, okay, now one more time for the slow kids. Swear to God, that's what he would say. <laughs> Swear to God. This yeah, is a, I'm that person. This like, is a I just time. looked up from I would their books. This is a time when you could say stuff like that with no no repercussions. Oh, I'm accidentally calling myself. I'm and sorry. And so then he, just, uh, then he once said, he once used to come in like, kids, remember this. Do LSD. And we're like, <gasps> what? Learn something daily. Ah. And so it stuck. That's the catch. It was. Mm-hmm. Relationship. That's an option on those phones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it gives me friend. notes. Yeah, it gives you and an I'll email do, and I'll notes. I'll do friend of Stacy Toy. All right. <sighs> and then I can do a photo and then I pop up his face Boom, when he calls. save. And then I'll do this and I'll go. During our podcast. It'll be like no, this will be edited this out. how it works. Maybe I can. Perfect. <laughs> For those who are listening, he just did a selfie of himself with uh, kind of like Doing the doctor, Austin Powers, kind of the Doctor Evil yeah, finger doctor. to the like for he, one the million dollars. <laughs> he probably did just shit himself. Oh, Brian, that's <laughs> that's well, that was like a lot of people. That was like a lot of people when they were like, "Could you just tell us about what Clerks Three is about?" And I'm like, "Well, I signed a non-disclosure, yeah. <laughs> which the penalty ranges from one to three million dollars. So if you pay me four million dollars, <laughs> hey, that's nice leverage. Three million, three million to pay for the penalty, even if it's three million. Mm-hmm. And I still have a million to live on because I'll never be able to work again. I actually read the script before Brian did. When Brian oh, wow. was given the script, however many years ago, 2015. I was on the road. He was on the road. And finally, I was like, look, I'm going to read it. And then, you know, when you get back, you read it and we'll discuss it. And I read it in one sitting because I read real fast and everything. And I was pissed. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. All um, right. Yeah. Um, we got to wrap it up. Yeah. Um, and I want to say, uh, did anyone notice Alex? What's <laughs> up, <Sorry, laughs> man? Behind the scenes. The best DP ever. Yeah. Um, so I want to say thank you yes. for your for your time for thank coming you. in. Um, I'm I'm I number one. Obviously, I've i at the moment I met you, I was like, this is my people. Yes. Um, <laughs> I felt the same way. I had such a great time when we filmed that she Toyota did, commercial. She did, I remember uh, her coming home. And uh, just being all like, and then this guy was like, oh my God. And then we did, it was just a shame that I had to leave at the end of the night. I thought it was a shit show, but (laughs) you always do. I always smile and go, it's going to be fine. Yeah. But I had to be back home because a friend of ours was getting married and mm -hmm. she, her, her, her shower was in the the following morning. I'm the guy that is like, I'm one degree from like red lipstick, just going like that. (laughs) <laughs> all over my face, like I'm losing my mind. <laughs> um, you got it all done. Listen, today. listen. Yeah. There, there's like that film, Color of Night, with Bruce Willis. <laughs> mm. yeah. All right, good reference. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you guys. Well, so Mark, much. thank you so much, yes, Stacey. Thank I would love you so guys much. to come back. I'd love to come back and talk. We're, back we're more. close I'd enough. I'd love to talk, talk, talk back and talk about you know being a survivor. And, sure, and for sure. Especially because isn't yeah. like October like the October is breast cancer, is breast cancer awareness. Yeah. Month. Will you come? Yes. Will you come for October, man? Sure. All right. I would cool. really yeah. love to. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, are you going to go out and read more? Or are you? Uh, what are you? What are you going to? I hope to, uh, you know, like, like I said, Kevin had put out that, that notice saying, Hey, we'll do more of the clerks three mm-hmm. reading. Uh, but in the meantime, yeah, you'll see me on the road at the uh, different events and, uh, my September and October hasn't filled up quite yet. So we'll say, I think you're, I, I think, well, I, you know, I can't speak enough about her, but I, you know, from meeting you, man, what a nice dude. Oh, thank mm-hmm. you, you know, brother. You have humility, you have grace, humility. That's, and that's my parents, my upbringing. That's my Irish Catholic mother, you know, <laughs> pinching me in the sides. Love it. Whispering, Way to go, Mrs. O'Halloran. Whispering, <laughs> whispering love. No, wait, what was your mother's maiden name? Uh, Heffernan. Mm. Is that Irish? Heffernan, yeah. Really? Yeah. Because my, my, uh, my mom then has we have no apostrophe. Some, <laughs> we have some Foley's, we have some Gray's, we have Sugru. Uh, we have a few. Did you go over there and check out your ancestry yet? Well, every summer was our summer vacation was over there. Over in Ireland? Yeah. Where, Where'd you guys go? Galway, the West Coast. I was in Galway. Yeah. it's the mm-hmm. it, That's their biggest artistic Is area. that where you um, honeymooned? No, it wasn't a honeymoon. There was like 10 of them. They all go like My idea of a honeymoon is like, all right, let's get some money in the till. And then like j- just her and I go away off the grid, turn the phones off for two weeks. I don't give a fuck unless somebody <laughs> dies. You know, and I'll just make sure I have money on the side in case somebody dies. I got to come back yeah. or somebody's sick, Yeah. you know, but if, if it's just her and I sitting on a beach, 
You know, I don't, I, I always go to vacations in, in cold places, but they're memorable. So we went to Ireland. Iceland. In July. We went yeah, to Iceland in July. If you get a chance, go Ireland to Iceland. Ireland in July is not cold, my friend. I know. Yeah, especially but now. It's they're colder having, than here. Uh, not anymore. They're having a massive heat wave this I year. Wearing, I was wearing sweatshirts. <laughs> then I come back mm. here and I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm no, it was kind of cold because I was in England the week before. Dressed in a bikini. And it was cold. It was like a, a mm. thing, but. That's but okay. any, I, I recommend anybody get out of the country just yeah, to get perspective. I, I always tell yeah. people to go to Ireland. I said, you know, you should just show up so and sweet. just, just mm-hmm. have your flight and then not have even a room even set aside and go yeah. to a local pub, sit up at the pub with your bags. And eventually one of the locals like, hey, Yank, what's yeah. with the bags? Where mm-hmm. you coming in from? Right. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, well, we're from New York. Uh, we just wanted to see the area and stuff. Uh, well, where are you staying? Oh, uh, we don't know yet. Oh, no, no, no. You sit there for one second. Mary! <laughs> Mary! <laughs> I knew you were going to say Mary. Uh, Tell Kevin to go over Sean's house. We're going to take over the bedroom. You don't mind the small kid's bed now. It's enough for the two of ye, but you'll be fine. <laughs> the next thing you know, if you're buying them drinks, you'll be staying at someone, you're getting the local feed. And the and beautiful else. thing about them, they don't need much. No. Mm-hmm. They don't need nope. much. They're mm-hmm. they're just like, you go over there and you're like... Especially the West. Now, if you go to Dublin... I Dublin County Mayo. Th- yeah, Dublin. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. Dublin is like a traditional, kind of any kind of European metropolitan right, city right. now. It's mm-hmm. It's really built itself up. Um, but once you get out to the west, the west is really the true coast, and the same thing with the the, the southern part of uh, Ireland, like Cork and Dingle and stuff mm-hmm. like in Kerry, especially. That's where my uncle's from, and it's uh, that's like a lot of the farms and stuff. And then if you go up more towards Sligo and into the north, the next thing you know, you're talking to people like that because the northern <laughs> Ireland accent is a little more quicker and more harder, and it almost sounds like the Valley Girl kind of thing of the Irish thing. <laughs> No, it's the uh, in the name of the father, uh, Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah, accent. it is. It yeah. is that northern or hardener kind of R's are like that. I did a play uh, over in Sussex County, actually, at the Tri State Actors Theater called Stones in Its Pockets. Stones in Your Pockets, and it's two actors playing thirty-two roles. I had seven. Wow. I had seventeen roles. What are they all fucking Alec Guinness. Seventeen, <laughs> seventeen roles of uh, both genders and fourteen dialects of Irish. Wow, I think I think we should we should get together maybe every other month and just shoot the shit sure. and just see what happens. I'd, Especially I'd, I'd if it fits fun. in your schedule, we have fun. I'd be fun. I'll get mm-hmm. crepes. I, I need to, yes <laughs> crepes. Crepes. Uh, and you know, it'd be funny to have my mom and, and sit in on one of them. She's like, I'll tell you. Tell her to come. Oh my yeah, God, I'll for the love of God, please. Yes, I'll tell you some tell her stories. No, um, Do but you think uh, she'll come? <laughs> oh yeah, offer, to her. Uh, offer her a meal. She'll go anywhere. Tell her we get some food. We'll as get some fine she, Irish cuisine. As long yes. as she can make it to mass, she's all happy. Oh, we'll, we'll take d- her to St. Peter's. There I'll take her to St. Anne's Monastery. <laughs> yeah, there, there we go. go. I Ooh, we could drop her off. Yes. yes. They just had the novena in his backyard mm, for the grandma. Jesus' grandma. We found a new place. It's in Pennsylvania. And Ten guess days. what? Ten your, days. Your, your, fit, your, your board and everything. Is and tell her they have pizza board. Frida. Yeah. There you go. As long as she has pizza Frida. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. You did not have to do this, and I'm happy you're here. So thank you so, so much. 